Hi, and welcome to In Search of Insight, Nootropics Depot's monthly podcast. I'm your host, Erica, and sitting next to me is our product specialist, Emil. Hey, everyone. This month, Emil and I are going to be telling you about a really exciting new product that we have, tiger milk mushroom extract. This stuff. And as per usual, we'll be taking some of it. So maybe now is immediately a good time to take a dose of it. Absolutely. I'm always ready for some tiger milk mushroom. We can see how the effects develop. And you've been a big fan of it. Yes. I've also liked it. But let's see if we can get some more acute effects. So we already took a dose this morning, uh, just a single capsule. Uh, Now we will take two capsules. So this is double the recommended dose. We also already have some tiger milk in our system. So if we're going to get any really more perceptible acute effects, I I get some acute effects, but it's it's more of a long-term thing for me. You get some acute effects too. Yes. Uh, But if we do get more pronounced acute effects, we will feel it with two capsules with already some in there. So let's try that out and then you can potentially see some some changes happen in us. So here is your dose. And the better perceptible benefits we can feel, the more we can tell you about it just in the moment while this podcast is actually happening. Yeah. All right. So cheers. Cheers. Capsule cheers. (laughs) Okay. All right. So a double dose of tiger milk. Down On the top of a normal dose that we took about six hours ago. It's the afternoon now, so we've had some in our system. I'm really liking it at this point in the year because there is a lot of pollen, so I'm having some seasonal allergy issues, and the tiger milk mushroom has a nice effect on respiratory health. That effect over the last six hours has started to decline a little bit. The pollen is starting to get a little bit heavier right now, what I could see on the pollen radar. So it will be nice to see if I get maybe a little bit more of my airways opening up kind of effect, which would be very appreciated at this point. Maybe you can hear it in my voice a little bit too, and maybe that will change a little bit as well. A little bit less hoarseness, a little bit more clarity in my voice. So let's see if that happens. Yeah, I'm really curious to know if you notice changes while the podcast is happening. What I've noticed from tiger milk so far is that it's helped with some feelings of um, digestion. I have less digestive discomfort since starting to take tiger milk mushroom. And I also am curious to know if this has anything to do with just general like abdominal comfort or discomfort, because while Emil was talking about the respiratory benefits of tiger milk, I can't say that I noticed that specifically in my breathing, but what I do notice is that I feel more relaxed in uh, my abdomen, in my stomach, both digestive and also just tension wise. So I find myself breathing deeper into my lungs and that might be the one part of the respiratory effects that I've already started to tell. Potentially, and it could have something to do with the inflammation regulating effects. And we know that beta glucans are important for um, general GI function. But before we get into that, we'll definitely dive deep into that topic. Maybe we should talk a little bit about some new products we released? Yes, definitely. So we're going to talk to you about three new products that were released since our last podcast episode. And we will save the best for last, the topic of this month, for the end. But we're going to start with talking about CoQ10, a new uh, CoQsol supplement. Uh, So CoQsol is actually, CoQsol CF is a supplement that we take. Uh, It is a form of coenzyme Q10 um, and it's a proprietary formulation. So this is not a CoQsol, it is a CoQ10 um, product. And this one is ubiquinone. So coenzyme Q10, we'll just call it CoQ10 for for brevity. CoQ10 can exist in two different forms. So you can have oxidized CoQ10, which is called ubiquinone, and you can have reduced CoQ10, which is called ubiquinol. So in our already existing CoQ10 products, we have CoQsol CF, which Erica just mentioned, and in CoQsol CF, we have the ubiquinone form. We have another one called CoQH CF, and in that form there's ubiquinol. And then we always had just regular old CoQ10 powder, and that CoQ10 powder is actually ubiquinone as well. Okay. 
But the CoQ10 powder, I'm not sure, have you ever seen the CoQ10 powder? Is it really bright in color? Yeah, it's, it's really bright in color. It looks like uh, Cheeto dust. So yes. if you've been eating Cheetos and you got that stuff on your the dust on your fingers, that's what the CoQ10 powder looks like. It is also equally as sticky. Uh, so it's kind of an annoying powder to work with. It doesn't dissolve well in water, so it's kind of hard to take. Um, but some people really like the effects of just regular old ubiquinone or they don't like the, the orange burps that you get with Cocusol CF and CoQHCF because both of those have been dissolved in D-limonene, which is a terpene that's found in oranges, in lemons. And when you take D-limonene, uh, it kind of, it's a volatile compound, so it sits on the top of your stomach and you can burp it up. I honestly kind of enjoy that sensation. <laughs> it's, it's just like you've eaten kind of an orange, as weird as that sounds. Yeah. Other people don't totally enjoy that sensation all too much. So yeah. this... I don't enjoy it, but one thing I like about it is that when I feel and taste the, the orange burps coming up, I know that the... CoQ10 is starting to do its work. So yeah. it's not my favorite, but it does tell me that something is changing and happening in my body. And D limonene has some effects of its own. It's, it's a little bit energizing, uh, it's a little bit more calming. boosting. It's not necessarily calming, it's more on the energizing side of the okay. spectrum. Um, it's a nice compound, not everyone loves it, um, or it, it is also a little bit more premium option, the CoQSol CF and the CoQHCF. So with the CoQ10 capsules that we just released, which are the ubiquinone powder, you get a, a nice budget option of a higher dosage of uh, CoQ10. So you get 200 milligrams. Of course, the bioavailability in CoQSol CF is higher. So it's not necessarily going to be better than CoQSol CF. You are just getting a higher dose, which can override some of those bioavailability issues that regular old CoQ10 has. I have a question about ubiquinol and ubiquinone. No. Yes. yes, ubiquinol and ubiquinone. What's the big difference between the two? So the big difference, one is oxidized, one is reduced, but that doesn't really mean a lot in the context of effects. Oh, if, okay. If we are, t well, it, it does, but ah. it doesn't tell you or our viewers anything about the actual effects. Okay. Um, if you dive into what it's actually doing, so the oxidized form is entering the electron transport chain more readily, and there it helps carry electrons through the electron transport chain. So ubiquinone is really important for generating ATP, cellular energy. So if you take a ubiquinone supplement, um, the capsules we just came out with, or Cocisol CF, a lot of people will notice a kind of energizing effect, but not necessarily like a stimulant, more like you just feel a little bit more recharged, and that's that enhanced ATP synthesis at work. Ubiquinol, on the other hand, is much better at regulating oxidation. So it is reduced and it can actually become oxidized itself. And mm. through the process of becoming oxidized, it will neutralize oxidative uh, stress compounds like um, superoxide or um, hydrogen peroxide, those kind of things. It can interact with those molecules within our body and neutralize them by allowing itself to get oxidized, which then turns it back into ubiquinone. Okay. In my experience, when I have taken CoQHCF, I don't notice the energizing effects as readily. Uh, I do notice them after taking it for a while, but there's not really an acute energizing effect. That acute energizing effect is there with ubiquinone okay. because it can enter the electron transport chain more readily. The one thing to keep in mind is that Ubiquinone and ubiquinol, they make a redox pair, so they will switch between each other. So if Aha. you're taking ubiquinol, you will end up with ubiquinone at some point, and if you're taking ubiquinone, you will end up with ubiquinol at some point. But it's not the most exciting new product release we've done. It's something we already have. We, we had it in powder, so this product is just that powder in a more convenient capsule. Okay. I think that is a great option for people looking for a more pure ubiquinone supplement in a slightly higher dosage. So that's, okay. that's that new product release. Awesome, good to know. And we are taking CoQ10, which is ubiquinol, right? No, so CoQ10 mm -hmm. can exist either as ubiquinone mm -hmm. or it can exist as ubiquinol. 
Uh -huh. But it's the same thing. Okay. So coenzyme Q10 is a catch-all for both ubiquinone and ubiquinol. Uh -huh. Ubiquinone being the reduced or the oxidized form, sorry. Okay. Ubiquinol being the reduced form of CoQ10. Okay. But they are both CoQ10. Okay. And it's correct. We are taking CoQ Sol CF, which is ubiquinone and ubiquinone that has been dissolved in D-limonene. Okay. And because of that, uh, it is crystal free. And this maybe gets a little bit on the, the, the more complex side of things, but the crystal form of certain compounds can have an effect on how it absorbs. Uh -huh. So if something is dissolved in a liquid carrier, like D-limonene, then the crystal is no longer there. So you're no longer up against that crystal morphology, the, uh, how the crystal is shaped and how it will then absorb. Okay. Um, that is something you don't get with the CoQ10 capsules, the, just the powder. Okay. Uh, and because of that, the bioavailability is not as high as in Cocisol CF, but it is still adequate and the higher dose, the double the dose. So Cocisol CF contains 100 milligrams of CoQ10. The CoQ10 capsules uh, contain 200 milligrams of CoQ10 as a ubiquinone. We have actually switched back and forth. I personally really think that D-limonene adds another effect profile on top of the CoQ10, uh, the ubiquinone. So I like taking CoQ Sol CF a little bit more than I like taking just regular CoQ10 powder. What I do have to say is that effects wise, they are quite similar. So a lot of the benefits that I get from CoQ Sol CF, I get from just the powder CoQ10 ubiquinone. It's still a little bit energizing. It has a good effect on physical performance. It has a good effect on my brain. Um, I get some migraines. I don't necessarily get migraines when I'm taking a CoQ10 supplement. Um, so just for enhancing overall cellular energy, ATP, brain function, you need ubiquinone and you need ubiquinol in, in quite high amount. So having them around in a supplement, taking them exogenously is really nice. And this is a good option for that. Okay. Thank you for clarifying of that. Course. I'm sure there's probably some of you who get confused with these two different forms. And this is similar to a lot of products that we carry. Um, we do carry multiple forms of a similar compound mm -hmm. um, in a lot of different cases, but talking it through and knowing what the difference is can be really helpful to finding yes. the one that's right for you. Absolutely. Okay, awesome. So let's move on to our next new product, which is an exciting and I think interesting um, mineral to talk about, which mm -hmm. is microzinc. Yeah, and, and the mineral being zinc. Yes. Microzinc kind of being our name for a specific formulation of zinc, and it's called sucrosomial zinc. So sucrosomial zinc, which is similar to our micro-mag, it uses the same technology. They both use the sucrose ester, which micro-encapsulate the mineral. So inside of that micro-capsule, you just have regular old zinc oxide, or in the case of micro-mag, regular old magnesium oxide, forms that have maybe somewhat wrongly, by the way, been associated with low bioavailability. But when you put them inside of a um, microcapsule of a sucrose ester, the sucrose ester is more readily uh, detected by our cells and the sucrose ester can pass through cellular membranes more readily and deposit the magnesium oxide or zinc oxide where it needs to be. And once zinc oxide or magnesium oxide enters just serum, then it falls apart and you get magnesium 2 plus or zinc 2 plus, the ionic forms of zinc and magnesium. And a little bit of, if, you, if that happens in your stomach, you also get a little bit of hydrochloride and chloride ions then get formed a little bit. But in the case of microzinc and micromag, the sucrosomial ester or the sucrose ester delivers the mineral where it needs to be, and then it will become the ionic form, and then it can go to work. Awesome. I have a question about mm -hmm. this um, little tiny package or this sort of transport package. Is it small enough for the microzinc to cross the blood-brain barrier? Yeah, it would cross the blood-brain barrier too. And of course, once the zinc has been absorbed, 
uh, and it's in serum, it can more readily end up in our uh, brain too, if it's just traveling through our bloodstream. The usual issue with absorption is getting it from the gastrointestinal system into our bloodstream. Once it's in our bloodstream, the absorption is happening a little bit more readily. Okay. One advantage too is that these sucrosomial esters are not necessarily detected as uh, minerals by our body. They are detected as the sucrosomial ester, the sucrose ester. So that means it is not necessarily competing with other minerals. So say the one issue with zinc is if you take especially larger doses of zinc, zinc and copper use the same transporter. So if you're taking elevated levels of zinc, then you can actually end up with a deficiency in copper. So that's not great. With micro zinc, you don't necessarily have that effect going on. There are still some other effects where it can compete. So it's still important not to take very high doses of zinc because high doses of zinc on a cellular level could still deplete um, copper levels a little bit, but at the right dosage, which we'll talk about in a second, that's okay. But it's not competing with zinc or with copper at the transporter. So an example of this or an analogy could be rather than having a, a two lane road or even a single lane road, we have a five lane road and the sucrosomial, um, what, what were you calling sucrose it? Sucrose ester. The sucrose ester, yes, is like its own little package traveling on its own lane. Yeah, correct. Okay. Uh, another way if we want to go with the car analogy would be you're trying to get in the car but there's no more seat available for you. Uh, so yeah. that car being the transporter for all your mineral buddies, uh, but all seats are taken up by your mineral buddies and now copper is left out and can't go to where it needs to go. Okay. Similar here. So if you're intaking zinc, zinc and copper can then compete for the same transporter and then you might drop your copper levels because we need a little bit less copper. We're not getting a ton of copper from our diets, but it's really important for overall neurological functioning. So maintaining that zinc to copper ratio is important. And that's one benefit of micro zinc. You're not necessarily competing with the transporter because we're using a different transporter to get the zinc to where it needs to go. Now, we've already had microsync for a really long time, so this is not necessarily a new product. A lot of you are probably familiar with it, you're maybe already taking it, but you're, you've been taking it in a lower dose. When we came out with microsync, we had zinc in a few other products, and our idea was you might take, for example, our immune defense, which contains eight milligrams of zinc through microsync, and you might take micro zinc by itself again or you might take sleep support which in the past also contained um, micro zinc but not anymore so with that in mind we we stayed a little bit on the conservative side with zinc dosing a lot of you though have requested a higher dose zinc because you enjoy the effects of a little bit more zinc so with the eight milligram elemental dose which you were getting in our previous elemental or micro zinc product that was a little bit under the RDI, the recommended daily intake level, I believe at 80%. With this new one, you are getting 16 milligrams of zinc, so double the dose, so now you're above the RDI, so you're looking at 160% of your RDI, which is still within a very reasonable um, frame. So you don't really wanna go a whole lot more beyond that dosage level. So for example, if you are taking our immune defense, go with the lower dose zinc option, because then together you are getting 16 milligrams of uh, elemental zinc. If you were to take our higher dose micro zinc that we just came out with and you were to pair that with immune defense, now you're getting into a zinc level that's maybe not so great. So we need a certain amount of zinc, but if you overdo it on zinc, which is the case with a lot of these trace minerals, then the zinc can actually have some toxic effects. So you do not want to dose zinc too high. So keep this in mind too. If you are maybe taking a um, multivitamin that has already a high dosage level of zinc in there, you do not want to be taking this higher dose zinc product. This higher dose zinc product is really for those that are not taking many other zinc sources and want to get as much zinc as is still reasonable to take in without getting weird effects, then this new one is for you. Okay, awesome. And 
now that we have that really important info about the, the potential um, pitfalls of too much zinc supplementation, I'm curious to hit on just the main benefits that we can determine mm -hmm. from zinc. Yeah. So one of the things you get with zinc is enhanced neurological functioning. You might feel this as a lift in mood, uh, a lift in energy levels, and more importantly for a lot of you, a lift in libido, uh, a, a bit of a lift in confidence. So that's if you're looking at the more perceptible, acute kind of effects, the, the effects that will build up after a while that you can really feel. Other than that, zinc is really important for our immune function. So if we're not getting enough zinc, we're going to have decreased immune function. If we get enough zinc, our immune function is going to be optimal where it needs to be. Of course, there are other factors involved there, but zinc is an important mediator of our immune function. So that's important to keep in mind. And zinc is something that not a whole lot of us are probably getting enough of. Um, as we've talked about in the magnesium episode, uh, the minerals have to come from somewhere. So if you're looking at where we're usually getting uh, magnesium or zinc from, it's from uh, crops. And those crops are not synthesizing zinc or magnesium, so those crops have to get it from somewhere too. And these are metals. So zinc is a metal, magnesium is a metal. So where are these metals coming from? They're coming from the ground. So they're coming from the soil. But if a soil has been over farmed or you are maybe getting a food source from like a, a hydroponic setup or something like that, and they're not putting the necessary amount of zinc or magnesium in that growing solution, then it's not going to transfer to the crop. And same thing with animals. Animals our animal proteins are good sources of zinc and magnesium, but only if those animals are also eating adequate amounts of magnesium and zinc through their diet. So if our soils are de being depleted and we're not getting enough zinc or magnesium from the soils, then animal proteins are going to be lower in zinc and magnesium and food crops like um, dark leafy greens, for example, are going to be a little bit lower. Um, there is a lot of seafood that is high in zinc though. There is zinc in the ocean, uh, just kind of floating around as ionic zinc. So the seafood is still probably a really good source of uh, zinc, especially things like oysters, but we're not eating oysters all the time. So Unfortunately. <laughs> if you look at general populations, we're probably a little bit low on zinc and we're definitely low on magnesium. So it's nice to be able to up those zinc and magnesium levels. Absolutely. And zinc is also really important for uh, people in, interested in testosterone synthesis. So zinc plays a role there too. Topping up your zinc levels can help with overall testosterone, can help with those physical performance goals that you may have. Okay, awesome. So it sounds like zinc is going to be a really important essential supplement to add into your daily stack if you are wanting to really support your immune function, you're looking for some of those mood and libido benefits, and mm -hmm. if you're really specific about uh, supporting the exercise that you're doing in the gym, or let's say you're a bodybuilder, an athlete, or someone who just wants to really bolster your testosterone, this would be a great option for you. Absolutely. Okay, now that we've been talking a little bit about immune function, mm -hmm. I'm also curious to get started talking about our main topic for today, which is tiger milk mushrooms. Yes. And tiger milk mushroom is one that you might not be as familiar with as some of the other popular mushrooms on the market, specifically lion's mane mushroom. But today we're gonna to talk to you about why tiger milk might be a great uh, addition or even alternative to your lion's mane supplementation. And we're going to tell you a little bit about where tiger milk is found, some exciting developments and how it's now being cultivated. Um, of course, we'll explain why we came to this extract and the process there. Um, but it's let's not get an extract, started. actually, but we'll talk about that in a second. Ooh, awesome. Yeah. So actually, why don't we just start with that? Start with talking about the fact that it's not an extract. Yeah. Um, so this tiger milk mushroom, we don't necessarily know what exactly in tiger milk mushroom is causing some of the beneficial effects. And actually, I'll 
uh, ruin the surprise just a little bit, but in a second, we're actually going to call up Jay, our lab director, and we can talk a little bit more about the testing we are doing for tiger milk mushroom and also lion's mane that Erica mentioned earlier. So we'll go into it a little bit more in depth there. But for the time being, we don't know exactly what is in tiger milk mushroom that is producing some of these beneficial effects. And because of that, if we go for an extract, then we are potentially leaving out compounds that we want, since we're not totally sure what we're looking for. So for example, with Rishi, uh, Ganoderma lucidum, it's a lot easier. We know that we want the ganoderic acids, we have reference standards for these ganoderic acids, and we can develop extraction methodologies that then take out that ganoderic acid and concentrate it, and still produce a full spectrum effect, but focused on those ganoderic acids. With tiger milk, we don't necessarily know what's in there. So instead of going for an extract, what we've done is we have just gone for pure, high quality sclerotium, um, we'll touch in a second on what sclerotium is. That deserves definitely a little bit more attention, but that is the part of the mushroom that we want. We went with a really high quality one from a really talented cultivator. So that means that the sclerotium itself, the mushroom material itself is really potent and we don't necessarily have to extract it to get out the goodies. Okay. We are then standardizing it for beta-glucans, which is 50% beta-glucans. That's a lot. Uh, you don't necessarily see that in some of our other mushrooms. For example, I know cordyceps mushrooms. I looked at that one recently, our one-to-one Cordyceps product is 25% beta-glucans. So this is twice as high. Of course, that doesn't mean our Cordyceps one-to-one -one is a low-quality product. It just means that tiger milk mushroom is producing more beta-glucans. And part of that has to do with the part of the mushroom that we're using. Yes, I wanted to get to this right away because yeah. I think this will help um, just introduce why tiger milk is such a rare and interesting mushroom. So the part of the mushroom that's being used for this supplement is the sclerotium or sclerodium. Mm -hmm. And that is an underground tuber-like formation of highly condensed mycelium. So tiger milk mushroom does actually create a fruiting body as well. And maybe we can show a picture of it somewhere here. Yes. So you have the sclerotium and out of the sclerotium, when the conditions are ideal, you'll get a fruiting body. Sclerotium, there aren't a whole lot of mushrooms that produce sclerotium, but it's a really interesting strategy that certain mushrooms use to kind of survive extreme weather conditions. So mushrooms are quite finicky. Uh, we will talk about this later a little bit with J2 in the uh, Mushroom Kingdom project where we are cultivating a lion's mane. Mushrooms really like a very strict kind of range of temperature and humidity. If the temperature and humidity is not right, they won't grow. So if you just go out into a forest right now in the Netherlands, you won't really find any mushrooms. It's been really dry, it's been really hot, uncharacteristically so. And, and after a very wet and cool spring as well. Exactly. So normally you might find a few mushrooms here and there, but we've been going out and we haven't really been finding any mushrooms. It's, it's not humid enough, there's not enough moisture. Um, also, temperatures are a little bit too high. And, and normally you don't have a ton of mushrooms in the summer, but what you do have is mycelium networks everywhere still. So there is still mycelium. And then when the conditions are right, for example, in the fall, then the forest here, they will really explode with mushrooms. And a similar thing here with tiger milk mushroom, it's growing in um, Malaysia, in Southeast Asia, uh, usually kind of hot temperatures and I'm actually not totally sure when it normally sprouts. I'm not totally sure if anyone really knows. It's a bit of a mysterious mushroom in that sense. But the one thing is with this tight knit um, kind of clump of mycelium, it can store a lot of energy there. It can store a lot of nutrients. It can store a lot of beta-glucans. Yes. So if you look at other sclerotium products, so for example, our Poria mushroom, that's a sclerotium. And that also has 50% beta-glucans. Okay. So really all of that, that energy that it needs to create a fruiting body, it's concentrating there. This reminds me of something just as a concept that 
perhaps the sclerotium is similar to a placenta that's providing some kind of protection, energy, and sort of storing everything that the eventual fruiting body is going to need in order to break through the ground and grow into like its full form. Yeah, you can maybe see it in that sense. That that's an interesting comparison to make. Yeah, it's just like an, a big energy reserve that it can then use to create the fruiting body. Or an egg yolk, for that matter. Or an egg yolk, or something like that. Some a high density, nutrient rich source that can then result in a fruiting body. Yeah. That does mean that before the sclerotium produces a fruiting body, that's actually when it's going to have the most amount of bioactives in there. Because that's when all the nutrients will still be contained in this part of the mushroom, or before the mushroom becomes a, a, a fruiting visible body. fruiting yes, body. Exactly. And it's still going to be protected underground. Correct. That does make the whole story of tiger milk mushroom very difficult, because for one, they don't grow in large numbers in one location in the wild. So if you find a sclerotium, even if you were able to find it without the fruiting body sticking out and indicating where a sclerotium is, the next mushroom, the tiger milk mushroom, might be three, four kilometers away. And this is actually where the name tiger milk comes from in folklore. Mm -hmm. um, the, the story is that a tiger was nursing her cubs and spilled her milk in the ground and then under that spot where the milk was spilled this sclerotium was formed and then the tiger milk mushroom pops through the ground uh, but tigers are wise and they know how to hunt and they know how to hide and they don't hang out in large groups mm -hmm. so that also says something about the nature of tiger's milk mushroom because it's not going to be found in large amounts in any one particular spot but quite spread apart from each other Very spread apart. in remote areas and uh, difficult to find. And specifically difficult to find a sclerotium that hasn't fruited yet. Of course, so, because you can't see it. Exactly. So when you're finding tiger milk mushroom in the wild, it usually is being found because you can see the fruiting body. And then if you're on time, there is still a bit of sclerotium left. But ideally, you would want to find the sclerotium before it has fruited. But it's pretty much impossible to find unfruited sclerotium in the wild because there really wouldn't be any above ground indicator of where it is. It's kind of similar to truffles. So truffles are really expensive because they're hard to find because they grow under the ground and you can't necessarily, there's nothing above ground that will tell you, hey, that's where a truffle is. Of course, there are animals that can smell truffles um, you have pigs, for example. Uh, there's a really nice movie with, uh, what's his name? Nicolas Cage. Yes. About Nicolas Cage, well, or the character he's playing, and his truffle pig, and they go out and find... It, it's a sad story. But check it out. It's check really it out. worth it's a watch. good movie. <laughs> but anyways, there are certain animals that can sniff it out. As far yes. as I know, there aren't any animals that can sniff out a, a sclerotion. Maybe a tiger can, but I'm not yeah. sure you can work with a tiger to find a sclerotion. I'm not sure about that either, but this does lead us into talking about um, the problem that that creates then. So if we can't find the sclerotion underground because there's no above ground indicators, then we can't reliably uh, gather sclerotium to create any kind of a regular uh, product or even just take it in its pure form uh, for its benefits. Perhaps that's a reason why you haven't seen very many tiger milk mushroom supplements until more recently, and this is because of the developments that have happened with cultivating tiger milk mushroom. And that is to say we haven't seen tiger milk mushroom supplements in the Western world, but that yes. is not to say there haven't been tiger milk mushroom supplements in other parts of the world, specifically Asia, more specifically Malaysia. Yes. So one of the reasons we know about what tiger milk mushroom can do is because the indigenous people in certain areas in Malaysia are going out into the forest and they're hunting for this mushroom and they're using it for its beneficial effects. And this is also how we, or not we, but how Dr. Tan Chan Seng, I believe I'm saying that correct, he got very interested in tiger milk mushroom um, because he was at a conference and the current prime minister of Malaysia was there at the time, I believe this was in about 2002, 
and there was a big panel of scientists and the prime minister at the time said he was having some respiratory issues and not a whole lot of things were happening or, or helping until he tried tiger milk mushroom and dr ten chan singh ended up being at that conference and he was really interested in this 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 person the prime minister was a doctor was very evidence focused and was in the medicine world and this doctor is talking about a kind of indigenous plant or fungus that is being used in traditional cultures for around 400 years already so he was really kind of amazed by this and then he started thinking when he was a young boy his mom would actually grind up some of this wild mushroom sclerotium the tiger milk mushroom sclerotium and give it to him when he was having a cough or something like that so this kind of sent him on a path how can i get more tiger milk mushroom to study and maybe to commercialize so more people can take it he then realized that finding it in the wild is really hard he actually went into the jungle he communicated with these uh, indigenous people who had a lot of knowledge about this mushroom he talked with them he interviewed them he went on hunting expeditions with them to find this mushroom and then he actually took cell cultures from wild tiger milk mushroom and he replicated that in the lab. This is a process I've done as well at home, actually. Um, if you take a mushroom, just I did it with lion's mane mushroom. If you slice a piece of the mushroom and you can be very, um, not totally sterile, but kind of using aseptic technique where you're not getting too many contaminants, you can actually transfer some of that mushroom material onto a Petri dish with a nutrient uh, agar solution so it's like a jelly with nutrients in there in which has been sterilized and you can put the mushroom tissue on there and then the mushroom tissue will grow mycelium from there so you can actually clone mushrooms quite easily in this way and this is exactly what dr tan chan Seng did he cloned wild tiger milk mushroom and put it on a petri dish and he had the mycelium and now he had to figure out how to cultivate it Apparently that took about eight years. So figuring out how to cultivate mushrooms indoor um, in a kind of a controlled setting can be really hard, especially for producing sclerotium apparently, and especially for tiger milk mushroom. And tiger milk mushroom has been known for a really long time already. So even, um, I forget exactly his name, but he basically started, I think it was a British guy who started a, a large portion of the rubber trade in Malaysia, he already knew about tiger milk mushroom. And I think this was in the 1800s. And he knew about tiger milk mushroom and he also wanted to cultivate it. Of course, at that point, it was really hard to make sterilizers and we, we just didn't know enough about how mushrooms were being or were growing in the wild and how to cultivate them. So he was unsuccessful. Dr. Tan Chan Seng, and this is happening in the 2000s, so fairly recently in the last 23 years, uh, and it took eight years. So really the last 10 years or so have kind of been the period where we figured out how to cultivate the sclerotium. So how it's being done and how Dr. Tan Chan Seng discovered to do it is very similar to cultivating normal mushrooms. Um, like lion's mane, but with a few different twists. So with normal lion's mane, we're starting with the mycelium cultured on a, on a dish or with uh, mycelium in the liquid. You call that liquid culture mycelium. And then you're inoculating grains with that uh, mycelium. Then the mycelium will grow on those grains. You call that grain spawn. And then you take that grain spawn and you put it in a substrate. And then that grain spawn will multiply in that um, substrate and then from there you slice the bag and we'll talk about this a little bit later with J2 you slice the bag and then the mushroom will grow out with tiger milk mushroom you want the sclerotium so you need to replicate an underground scenario which is a lot more difficult but they figured it out so very similar process you start with the mycelium you inoculate some grain spawn you mix that grain spawn with some substrate and then you let the substrate fully colonize. And this takes a lot longer with tiger milk mushroom. With lion's mane going from that initial mycelium to having a, a block of substrate ready to be cut into, if you're lucky, you can maybe do it in a month and a half, two months or so. With 
tiger milk mushroom, that whole process can take up until a year until you really have anything. So same thing. You start with that mycelium, grain spawn, substrate. You let the substrate colonize for a really long time. Once it is fully colonized, you put it under soil. So you just cover it with soil. And then in that soil, the sclerotium will form and that will take a really long time. So having to grow a mushroom for a year is kind of crazy. Now I think we've been able to kind of dial that back. There's also some individuals in the US that are now looking at cultivating, for example, Poria sclerotium. They've been able to speed it up a little bit too. Really good tip if you're into mushroom cultures and things like that, check out Terrestrial Fungi on Instagram. He has a website too, you can buy cultures from him, but he's doing an experiment on Poria sclerotium now, and he's been able to grow some big ones in like three or four months. So he's worth checking out, gives you a little bit more insight into what goes into sclerotium growing. Tiger milk, it seems it's a little bit more difficult even than Poria. It just takes a really long time and you have to bury it on the soil. It's, it's a complex process. But Dr. Tan Chan Seng eventually pulled it off. And now the most important thing here actually is that you can now take that tiger milk mushroom, the sclerotium, the much more potent sclerotium than you're finding in the wild because you can harvest it before a fruiting body comes out. It's really high in beta glucans. 50% like in ours and I'm sure Dr. Tan Chan Seng's um, sclerotium is very similar too. Now you can enter that into clinical trials. Okay. So because of the work Dr. Tan Chan Seng put in and they call him kind of the father of tiger milk mushroom, now we can actually do human clinical trials on it. We can look into the, the biochemistry of it and we're finding little things here and there. Of course, all we know right now is that beta-glucans, there's some high molecular weight proteins in here. There's probably some triterpenoids in here, similar as the triterpenoids in um, lion's mane, like the hericinones and the arinocenes, uh, and similar to the ganoderic acids, they're all triterpenoids. Poria contains triterpenoids, and usually it's the triterpenoids that have cognitive effects too, which Thai milk mushroom certainly does too. So I suspect there's probably some triterpenoids in here that we haven't discovered yet. So that will be really interesting to look into. Absolutely. But for now, we at least have tiger milk mushroom. Yeah. I think we're one of the first people in the US to have high potency tiger milk mushroom. So uh, it's been the talk of the town on Reddit recently. A lot of you are interested in this. And one of the reasons people are really interested in it is the NGF effects. But since we've been talking about kind of the quality uh, side of things, the cultivation side of things. I think it is a really good idea actually to call up Jay and yes. have a chat about beta glucans, mushroom testing, our lab, lion's mane cultivation, getting different compounds out there. And also with uh, tiger milk mushroom, actually being able to confirm that it is real tiger milk mushroom and, and the complexities behind that. So. Erica, you want to call up Jay? Yeah, let's give Jay, our lab director, a call and bring him on to tell you way more about the Mushroom Kingdom and Tiger Milk Mushroom. And then after that chat, we'll come back and talk about the NGF effects, the cognition enhancing effects, the respiratory and enhancing effects. And also our experience with taking Tiger Milk Mushroom yeah. on the podcast itself. Because I can feel it a little bit now, but Absolutely. after this call, I think we'll be able to feel a lot more. Yes. Hi, guys. Hey, hey, Jay! Long time no see. <laughs> Jinx, how's it going over there in Tempe? Good, starting to get hot. Haven't hit 110 yet, but we'll get there. Yeah, we were looking at the, the weather reports. It, it looks a little bit unpleasant at the moment. I'm glad we're here, even though it's a little bit warm here too and we have no air conditioning. So we're probably a little bit mm. hot, actually. <laughs> yeah, Only not for interested in that. that. Yeah. So for those of you who have never met Jay before, which probably at this point is all of you, um, this is Jay, our lab director. Jay is the lab director for Omniant Labs and the quality director for Nootropics Depot. And he's here to tell us a little bit about tiger milk mushroom, as well as some other really exciting mushroom projects going on at Nootropics Depot. So Jay, um, introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about what you do in these two different roles, and we'll get started talking about the exciting part, which is 
mushrooms? Sure. So uh, I have two roles here at Nootropics Depot. Uh, I run Omniate Labs. So we have um, about 15 or so people in the laboratory department now that uh, we do everything from making reference materials to the routine QC testing for Nootropics Depot, and we also offer third-party testing for uh, individual customers. So we have customers of Nootropics Depot that want their stuff tested that they purchase from other people, as well as uh, other companies that send us their products as well. Um, we also support research projects like people that are doing studies on nickel and things like that. So we do lots of testing besides just routine QC testing at Omniant Labs. Uh, we do a lot of analytical method development. We do a lot of research and development. And then we have a whole uh, research side associated with the creation of reference materials, which we'll talk about later uh, in this video. So as the laboratory director, I manage all of that stuff. On the quality director side, I manage the quality quality assurance, quality control team at Nootropics Depot. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar exactly how supplements are made, the testing part of it is distinct from the processing and manufacturing of it. So when you make a product, you put capsules in jars or you put powders in capsules or you make a powder into a tablet, there are different quality assurance steps along the way during the manufacture that you have to check. Uh, they have procedures, they have processes, they have statistical controls and engineering and environmental controls. Um, all of those parameters, specifications, documentation, the management, um, what the controls are, the HACCP plan, all those things are in the quality control, quality assurance department, and I manage that as well. So it sounds like you're pretty office, busy. Generally pretty messy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also, I get to make cool podcasts. <laughs> For those who don't completely uh, grasp the scale of our laboratory um, department either, how many people do we have now, Jay? Uh, I think we're around 15 in the lab, depending upon exactly how you count, because some positions double dip and things like that. Okay, so that's and quite good. Like, how many instruments do we have uh, at this point in time? Hmm. So if you go to notropicsdepot.com, you can click on the analytical lab tour and you can kind of walk around. That is about, how old is that now? About two years old, that video, I think, that we made? Yeah, that's about two years. Two, since two years. then, since yeah. then, we've definitely added another UPLC, so... Just off the top of my head, the big expensive instruments, we have the KMAG HPTLC system, uh, Agilent HPLC, uh, two U Waters UPLC MSs, two more Waters UPLCs, and then the usual FTIR, UV Viz, Water Activity, Melting Point, LOD, Bulk Tap Density. Um, on the analytical instrumentation side, for QC testing and R&D testing, those are the instruments we use. For the reference material generation, we also have some Buki setups. So we have a Buki R300 Rotovap as well as the L200 Lyophilizer and the C850 Prep uh, Flash uh, automated system, chr chromatographic system, which we use for making our reference materials. Which we'll, I don't think that's actually in the video that we had made earlier, but uh, mm -hmm. we are going to need to do another lab update because yeah. we're always expanding and growing. So. I'll yeah, want to add that into the next a little bit after, maybe too. Uh, but that oh, and the GC forgot about the GC. Sorry. And the Buki stuff you were talking about really forms the heart of our mushroom research as well, which we will talk a little bit later once we get to the mushroom kingdom. If anyone is yep. curious to learn more about these specific analytical instruments or to take a look in the analytical testing lab, um, you can see this lab tour on Nootropics Depot's website. And we will add a link to this YouTube video in the description below so that you can take a look and really get a feel for exactly what we're talking about. Um, but I'm curious to go into talking about these botanical reference materials because you mentioned that. And this is going to lead us right into talking about um, tiger milk mushroom. So tell us what is actually a botanical reference material and what kinds of reference materials are we working with currently? Yeah, so just the very notion of reference material is actually a hot topic in analytical and, um, and quality control chemistry because what you use for a reference, by definition, is your reference material, but there are different grades and qualities and metrics by which a reference material can be created. So if many people are familiar with normal analytical chemistry, you go on sigmaaldrich.com, things like that, and you can just buy a... Uh, analytical reference material. That's pretty common. On the botanical side, especially in the dietary supplement space, there are not as many of those available, especially ones that are what's called authenticated. So mm -hmm. authenticated reference materials are materials that are created by uh, companies, agencies, research organizations that are accredited through some level of organization 
Um, maybe FDA doesn't do that stuff, but uh, NSF can do it, uh, AHPA can do it, or AHP can do it, BR, uh, ABC, American, uh, American Botanical Council can do it. These are all places that have botanists on staff, and their entire job is just to identify a particular material and um, say that this specific material that we have is this plant part from this plant species, and maybe it also goes by this other name, which you might also know. There's an official book that you can actually find in FDA guidance documents and in the official 21 CFRs that uh, is called Herbs of Commerce. I think I got a copy on the shelf over there. But uh, it will tell you, like, this species means this name, and this species can be called this name. This is the common name for it. Um, everyone's familiar with that. Everything is called ginseng, for example. Um, so reference materials on the botanical side have to be authenticated. You can't just go in your yard and pull a flower and say, yeah, this is a rose, right? Because what does it mean to be a rose, right? Or what does it mean to be a dandelion? So if you get a brown powder from... Uh, sorry, a little feedback. If you get a brown powder from, you know, a manufacturer, how can you authenticate what that material is? You need something to compare to. That's what reference materials do, but you can't just go grab anything for sale on Etsy. Uh, we have done that. We've bought materials on Etsy, like flowers, passion flower, for example, and we have sent them to botanists and microscopists and done DNA testing to prove, okay, is this Passiflora incarnata? Is this Passiflora adula? Is it uh, alata or some other species that we don't know? Once we get that figured out, that can become our in-house reference material, and we keep that forever, and that's our kind of gold standard, and we use it over and over and over again for all subsequent tests. Um, in the dietary supplement space, uh, there's a phrase where uh, people use where it's uh, academia and uh, regulatory doesn't move at the speed of industry, right? Because companies can come out with new products, and we can develop things so much faster than academia can do the science, partially due to funding and uh, resource restraints um, and way faster than regulatory because the government has to go through all the, the long thorough steps of, of doing a thing no matter what it is. And so we're always in this space where we want to make a new product from maybe a new plant part or a new preparation of a plant that already exists but the reference material doesn't exist. So how do we solve that problem? The way we solve it here in Nootropics Depot is, and at Omniant Labs is by obtaining what we think is the material from Etsy or from the American Botanical Council or the American Herbal Pharmacopeia or whatever and then we contract out the botany part of it because I'm not a botanist, I'm an analytical chemist and we confirm or deny that this is indeed, this material that we provide them is indeed the plant part of interest and once it is then, we, then it becomes our in-house material. And it takes a lot of work to do that because surprise surprise, people, plants are very complex and people are very confused about what they actually are. So it takes a lot of background. We also want accurate instruments. We can't just look at something and go, yeah, that's what it is. And this is especially the case for something like tiger milk, because Jay, you have some of the tiger milk sclerotium uh, with you. Can you show it to us? Yeah, uh, tiger milk was one of the ones that fell into this category. So when we got it um, from the manufacturer that grows the material, it was a little ball about maybe this big, the size of a tennis ball or a baseball, and we had to get it confirmed externally through the process that I just confirmed. And this is essentially what's left after we chop it up in the lab and grind it up. And we'll see, hold it up a little bit. So you can see there's kind of an outer gray part, and then there's some white parts on the inside. This is my lab, or this is my, my personal desk sample that I have here. We have more in the lab. And then this is what we then use to compare future QC batches of Lignosis rhinoceros sclerodium, which is okay. weird language, but you know, you gotta learn a little Latin if you're gonna do this job. So absolutely for yeah. sure. And for the untrained eye, you look at these kind of white, kind of gray chunks, and you don't really know what you're looking at. At least if you're looking at a rose or a passion flower, at least you can maybe ballpark guess, okay, maybe that's a passion flower, maybe that's a rose, and it's still not super accurate. But here, for the average person, it would just be a complete guessing game. You can't just receive this. Yeah, I mean, I'm an expert in this field, and it's a guessing game for me, too. I have to go to other experts to say, guys, look at this under the microscope. Do your DNA work. Um, you know, do, uh, if you have physical structure, you can look at morphology and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, it's, it's even with all those tools it's, and lots of expertise, it's still very difficult. I'm curious to know, does the sclerotium look really different than the head of the mushroom or the part that's um, growing from it, yes. like on a cellular level, and, and how so? How does it look different? Um, I personally have not reviewed the microbiologist's work on the microscopy and macroscopy, so I can't speak to that part, but the, the 
phylogenetic part, so like what does it look like if you were just walking down the street and you saw it, absolutely yeah. looks different. So before we crushed it up and made little samples to send out to the labs, um, it was like I said, a small baseball, kind of lumpy in color, uh, brownish in color, lumpy in shape. Um, it looks like it would be spongy based on like kind of the, the divots and the surface of the moon, but, um, but it was actually reasonably hard and it was also dehydrated, so that probably aided to the, the physical characteristics as well. Um, it didn't look like anything you would ever call a mushroom, right? When people think mushroom, they think stick with a cap, you know, there's a mushroom. And yeah. uh, it doesn't look anything like that. It's basically just a clumpy little ball, um, kind of like what I think black hoof looks like. I think the black hoof sclerodium looks similar in terms of general structure. So it's like kind of a cluster of and poria poria too. So the poria mushroom. What's that? The, the poria mushroom. It's also a sclerodium. Poria, yeah. It also looks similar. Yeah. And as we talked about a little bit earlier in the podcast, the sclerotium is a really condensed mass of mycelium. So it kind of condenses. And a lot of the nutrition of the mushroom is in there. So a lot of uh, basically the, the life force for the mushroom is there. And it can... Uh, survive really extreme climate swings and things like that because mushrooms are pretty sensitive um, but if it's underground it's kind of shielded from the environment it can uh, survive a little bit more of an extreme temperature swings and then when the conditions are right all of that energy that is stored in the sclerotium can shoot out and a fruiting body can form from that and tiger milk mushroom does form a fruiting body and when it forms the fruiting body actually a lot of the active components that are in the sclerotium go away and i think that is a, a good leeway into talking a little bit about the actives but i do want to finish and say one of the reasons why we are so big on getting these botanical reference materials especially for these really esoteric mushrooms that are new on the market, because remember, we are one of the first people who are carrying tiger milk mushroom in the U.S. There, there isn't really anyone else who's doing that, so the science on it is a little bit lacking, and we need to be sure that what we have, this, this nondescript brownish uh, kind Clump of, of nutrients. <laughs> yeah, but especially yeah. Uh, it's hard to see. So we need to be sure that we know what we're doing. And I guess one thing we haven't talked about yet. So we have the botanical reference material, and then what? Then we go into HPTLC testing, right? To make sure. Yeah, exactly. Testing. Right. So once we can confirm that we have the right material and it's worth spending more time developing methods on, that's when we moved into our standard botanical identification methodology, which is HPTLC, high performance thin layer chromatography. If you're familiar with thin layer chromatography, the way I typically describe it is it's uh, thin layer chromatography, but with robots at every step to make it more precise uh, and more high throughput and more repeatable as well. Um, there's in the lab tour, you can see the actual instrumentation. In the Tongcat blog, you can see some of the methods we developed and what the plates look like. At the end of the day, you get a, a pretty plate. It has all kinds of different colored bands on it. Um, and what you're doing is you're, um, you're using the different compounds that are present in the material to be marker compounds to identify that material and that material only. So what we then have to do is we have to build an analytical method development using that technology that could confirm that the material that we have that we've identified properly as tiger milk um, matches what we get in as a QC raw material. And then we have to um, not only say, yes, it matches these two materials, so maybe we get you know, two things that look like that, okay, it's good, but we also need to show that it doesn't look like other things that could be similar to it. So poria sclerodium should look different in this method from Lignosus rhinoceros. Um, lion's mane fruiting body, lion's mane mycelium, uh, cordyceps, right? All the mushrooms should look different in this method. And so we have to spend the time to build the method so that it can not only identify the thing of interest, but also disidentify the things not of interest. So if you were to get a sample in that was mixed cordyceps and tiger's milk, you would know that because you'd see bands there that shouldn't belong. And um, that's part of the challenge as well because you have to allow for selectivity in the method. So the processes involved in creating this extract are extremely detailed and lengthy. <laughs> and you can be sure... Yeah, that, that was the short version. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can be sure that when you're taking the tiger milk extract that you are really getting tiger milk mushroom and that you are getting a really, really high quality extract uh, because we go through so many steps to make sure that we really know exactly what's going into the product and exactly what kinds of benefits you can get from it. 
And the fact that this is a new extract and a bit of a rare mushroom on the market makes that whole process even more exciting um, because it's one of the first. And we really like the effects of it also. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and the effects are coming probably not entirely from the beta glucans. So all mushrooms have beta glucans. Um, I think, Jay, they're, they're, they're somewhat similar. Uh, how different are the, the different beta-glucans from all the different mushrooms? So I don't have a fully comprehensive review of which beta-glucans are coming from which mushrooms or which mushroom parts or which fruiting body or fungal sources. But um, one of the things that we tend to do in the industry or as consumers is just blend the concept of beta-glucans all together, right? Beta-glucans are a category of long-chain uh, polysaccharides. Yeah. But polysaccharides can link together in many different ways, right? 1, 3, 1, 4, 1, 6, beta, uh, alpha, etc. And they all interact with the different cells in your body and your blood in different ways. And also they can be different lengths in addition, in a different, in addition to different um, uh, shapes as well. And so while the testing that we do is for beta-glucans and also for alpha-glucans to make sure that's not contaminated with cheap grains and things like that, um, we at present, there is no science to distinguish which beta-glucans are present in one particular species or another. And so that probably adds to the confusion as to which beta-glucans are doing what in the body. And there's papers out there, and we've talked about them, where you know interleukin-4 and interleukin-6 are more affected by beta-glucans from this species and not from this other species, things like that. But um, that would probably be one of the realms that we're going to continue to look at. But unfortunately, in order to do some of that work, you need to actually isolate enzymes that can specifically uh, interact with some beta-glucans and not others, and right now those don't exist, and that's a very niche, specific, high science, high IP position that's very difficult to do. There's companies that do it, but they haven't done it for the beta-glucans and the mushrooms uh, that we're interested in to date. Um, okay. So, for example, what we currently do with the beta-glucan testing is using the Megazyme kit for determinant of total glucans and determinant of alpha-glucans. And um, we use those as the quality markers to make sure it's not contaminated, grown on grain, and uh, adulterated with grains and things like that. So the alpha-glucan spec has to be extremely low. And then we have a beta-glucan spec, which is more of the quality marker. So I forget exactly what the specification is for uh, tiger milk, but um, <laughs> essentially we have a minimum threshold that it needs to be met in order for the material to be accepted. And if we get a batch in that does not pass uh, for that, then we just reject it and get a, send it back to the manufacturer and end up getting another one. Yeah. And, and it is 50% beta-glucans, which is... 50, um, okay. Yeah. You got the label in front of you. That's more handy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, which is really high. Yeah, that's one of the higher ones, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Poria mushroom, is, couple, I think. which is also a sclerotia. Go ahead, sorry. Uh, the poria mushroom is, is similar, too. I think it's also around 50%. So it seems like this... Yeah, 50, 55, maybe. Beta-glucans. Yeah, so in addition to the beta-glucans, we do like, loss on drying to keep track of you know, how the material is physically performing because if we're going to put it in capsules or tablets, the physical properties of the material matter as well, so particle size, bulk and tap density, things like that. Um, it, might be, it might be surprising for people to hear, but if you have a material that is exactly the same, but over time it slowly absorbs water, and people who have taken the cordyceps 10 to 1 know about this process, um, the material gets more hard, the particle size changes, it doesn't flow as much, you put it in your machine to make it do capsules, and now you have a QAQC issue, right? It doesn't make capsules, or the capsules break down, or they don't perform the way they're supposed to. So um, it's, it's not just important to focus on the chemistry of the material and the identity, which of course is important, we do do that, but we also need to keep track of the physical properties of the material, the bulk density, the tap density, the loss on drying, which is a measure of essentially the water, the surface water chemistry. Um, and then typical things like um, uh, water activity for microbial contamination or the heavy metals uh, via ICPMS gets done on every batch as well. And that's a nice easy test because everything dissolves in acid if you add enough acid. <laughs> so yeah. Analytical work on that side is actually very simple, which is nice. Yeah. And one thing I was trying to get at earlier with the beta-glucan thing, all mushrooms contain beta-glucan. Some of the beta-glucans are a little bit different, but there's a lot of similarity there. It's just what makes up the mushroom too. Like the whole mushroom is made up of beta-glucans. But there's probably other things that are in tiger milk mushroom, uh, other things that are in poria mushroom, but the science just isn't completely there yet. We don't know exactly oh, what's going on. So 
we know, for example, that in Poria there are triterpenoids, and it's probably those triterpenoids who add those more unique effects. It's probably similar in tiger milk mushroom. There are probably triterpenoids in there. The issue with tiger milk mushroom, as we talked about a little bit earlier too, is in nature, the, the fruiting bodies and the sclerotium, they grow kilometers apart from each other. So it's really hard to get a large amount of it to do any sort of meaningful research on there. So we had to be able to cultivate it first. And we only really figured out how to cultivate it, I think, uh, like a decade ago or something like that. And oh, wow. scaling up is, is still not totally there. So the research is really behind on tiger milk mushroom. I find it fascinating that we don't know as much about beta-glucans or triterpenoids. And I'm not sure if this is specific to mushrooms or other botanicals, but mushrooms seem to be a category of supplements that we offer that there's a lot of new research um, coming out and being done right now all the time and there's a lot that we don't know which i think makes mushrooms um, exciting and definitely exciting for nootropics depot because there's a lot to be discovered and that's also perhaps a good uh segue to talk about what we do yes exactly a project that we work on um, which jay can introduce to you both for tiger milk mushroom but also for some other mushroom varieties which you are definitely already aware of and I think right before we break into the Mushroom Kingdom, that's what this uh, project is called, and it's something Jay and I started when I was still in Phoenix. Super exciting. I do just want to quickly sum up and say, so for Tiger Milk Mushroom, we're getting it in. We're doing the botanical reference material. We're getting that certified. We're then doing HBTLC testing. Now, when we get a powder in, we know exactly what that powder is. We know that it's tiny milk mushroom. If it's not showing up on those bands on the HBTLC, we will reject it. It will get sent back. We want only real tiger milk mushroom. Then we do the Megazyme testing to test for beta-glucans. And actually, Jay, can you give just a very quick uh, high-level overview of what that process is like, the Megazyme test? Not good at speaking high level quick, <laughs> but yeah, so the Megazyme test is basically you have a, a material that contains a bunch of different polysaccharides, alpha-glucans, beta-glucans, whatever it might be. It could work on cereals, it works on grains, works on mushrooms, works on plants. Um, there's all different kinds um, that you can do, it works on bread. Um, essentially, you're going to add, what we do is we do two tests. We do what we call total glucan, which measures all the glucans that are present. And then we do alpha glucan, which only measures one specific subsite, subset of glucans. And those then are when we subtract, stuff we don't want, right? Those are the alpha glucans that we, in our products, want them to not be there. That is correct. Yes, that would be like um, and so, rice, potatoes, other types of yeah, grain. Right. If you see those mycelium on grain products, you can very yep. easily spot them because there's alpha glucans in there and you're basically just eating expensive rice at that point. Yeah, pretty much. So that's how we know that we're not getting the contaminated product by doing the alpha glucan and having a low specification, uh, 1%, 2%. I think most of them are about 5% because we expect the mushrooms to make some alpha glucans. We, they should be there. It should not be zero. If you get zero, something is going wrong with your test. Um, so anyway, what we do is we add an enzyme to the material that will only degrade alpha glucans. It will degrade alpha glucans into glucose. We then have to do another chemistry step, which will derivatize the glucose and allow us to see it on the UV vis. That's what gives us the uh, alpha glucan measurement. We then repeat the process, but with a different enzyme that only degrades um, the beta glucans, and uh, or I'm sorry, with a different enzyme that degrades uh, the. Let's see, we did the one that did the alpha glucans. Then we do a different set of enzymes. It's actually a cluster. I think it's two or three of them, beta, exoglucanidase, or whatever. But uh, it will degrade all of the glucans, and then we'll just measure the total glucans using the same chemistry. So we'll tag the uh, glucose with a derivatization reagent, and then we measure that on the UV-Vis, and then by subtracting total glucans observed, alpha glucans reserved, the difference between the two is the beta glucans observed. That's where the numbers come from. And, then, and that's um, what everyone in the world is doing using that kit, which is pretty much everyone in the world is making be proper beta-glucan measurements. Okay. Yeah. And out of curiosity, after you have dissolved the alpha and beta-glucans, how much material is left? Is there anything? Is there much at all? Do we know what it is? You mean like in the little tube that we do it in? Yeah. Ooh, um, that's a good question. Um, 
we try to intentionally add enough material, and this is figured out when you develop and validate the test method uh, for the material, and that's a whole other thing I'll be talking about in the future on another video, but um, when you validate the method for the material, you only use enough material so all of it dissolves, so you can ensure that you're getting 100% reaction. If okay. you were to do this test, for example, with twice as much material as you're supposed to, and you get like little powders of little stuff floating around at the bottom, and you can no longer trust your answer because you don't know if the answer that you got is correct because the material that you didn't measure is floating at the bottom because you used too much, or did you actually get the right amount and what's left at the bottom is stuff that you don't care about that has none of the thing you're trying to measure. So solubility of samples is part of the method validation verification procedure that we have to do for each material, for each method, every time we get a new product in. Okay, so that adds complexity. But yeah. I guess that before we get too deep into it, again, Jay will be starting yeah. his own uh, little channel offshoot and he will be going super deep into the science. So if that's your thing, go check that out. I know I will even personally be watching it because I can always learn more about the analytical chemistry side of things. It is super complex. Uh, it's very interesting to learn about. So definitely check that out. If you have a specific question mm -hmm. also about um, the analytical testing lab or any of the processes that we've been discussing with Jay, please let us know on Reddit because we would love to mm -hmm. learn about your questions and what you're interested in related to the lab and related to these processes. And if you're not already subscribed to our subreddit, go find us, um, r slash Nootropics Depot. So at long last, Emil. So yeah, we do the, the HPTLC testing, we know what it is, now we know the active 50% beta-glucans, we know that that is at least going to give us consistency in results, there is still more to learn about that, maybe at some point we do more research about that, check maybe if there is some kind of triterpenoid in there, that's something sometimes we see on an HPTLC plate too, if there's a band that shows up, maybe we see other bands that are triterpenoids in a different mushroom, then maybe we can make some guesses there and start doing investigative mm -hmm. work. Um, yep. So going on from there, then we do some um, heavy metal testing, make sure it's a safe product to take. It has to adhere to Prop 65. Um, so the, the lowest um, heavy metal um, guideline on the planet. So you know it's always going to be a really clean product. Uh, usually stuff actually on the industry comes in a little bit higher and we request special custom batches to be made to adhere there. So that's part of the testing we do too. And then we do some water activity and, and a bunch of other routine tests to make sure it's the, the best quality we can get it. Uh, and for it to have really good consistent effects batch to batch. So every time you order Tiger Milk again, you will be uh, guaranteed that you're, even though it's a natural product, you're getting very similar effects. And that is really amazing with something like tiger milk mushroom, which isn't even an extract. So we're really working with a really high quality raw material from a high quality mushroom cultivator. And I think that can bring us into the next section of this, which is to actually take a look at some of the mushroom cultivation we are doing and some of the research we are doing to be able to extract certain compounds from lion's mane to be able to make reference standards out of that. So we can actually, for the first time ever, accurately test arenosine A in lion's mane mycelium, which is a really big deal. It's never been able to be done before. There's no reference standards out there. We are the first, right, Jay? Um, there's no commercially available reference standards, correct. There are research groups that have made them. I'm aware of, I think, one other lab that's actively working on it, but we beat them to the punch and we got ours already and already have started using yeah. it. So, um, And we're working on our third one now. We already have two done. Um, but yeah, so um, speaking of lion's mane, it's a very interesting mushroom. It makes lots of really interesting compounds. Uh, I have a little bit of a personal horse in this race because a lot of the research um, for lion's mane uh, points in very helpful directions for people uh, like my mother, who are not the healthiest of people, that I'm really looking forward to making a product that can potentially help them in a clinical way, so that would be great. I don't want to say too much about that, but um, what we were doing here with Lion's Mane is uh, multifold. First of all, we want to advance the science of Lion's Mane, so in, insofar as we need to do that, we need to answer a lot of questions. For example, where do the active compounds come from? What are the active compounds? What are the permutations of these active compounds? 
uh, do they have isomers and things like that. What research exists to support that these indeed are the active compounds versus these other things that are similar but not those things? Um, when does the mushroom or when does the fungal source make them? Is it in the mycelium? Is it during growing mycelium? Is it after fruiting? Is it after a first flush of fruiting? Where in its life cycle does it make these compounds? Where does it make them in the most quantity that's most interesting to us if we're trying to isolate them for a standardized extract? And then, can it be commercialized? Can we do it in a financially reasonable way such that we can make an actual consistent product given all the restraints of everything we just discussed? Um, in a way that isn't going to be $400 a bottle for a consumer. So we started this project many, many years ago. Uh, I don't remember exactly when it started because it went from various stages of ideas to let's work on this to let's do that. And now we're finally at the stage where we're actively in, uh, well into the project. So uh, what we're doing is a two-fold structure for developing the next-gen Lion's Mane product. The first, uh, the first part is to determine what compounds are being made at what stage of the growth cycle by which species and strains of the mushroom of interest, in this case lion's mane, Hericium arenaceus, and we're going to grow them under identical conditions in our grow tent, which I'll show you in a minute, and then we are going to do all the background analytical work to see what compounds are present and how much so that we can make this next-gen product. Um, after we've identified a strain that performs well under our growth conditions, then we're going to optimize the growth conditions and Without getting into too much detail, we've already done some of that background work through a variety of other means and mechanisms. So we already have a very big leg up on how we're going to do that. So we will take the best performing uh, strain that we find. We have, I think, 21 strains growing right now. And we will then optimize the growth conditions to make the maximum amount of the compounds of interest, which then when we extract them will give us the highest extraction efficiency and therefore will make the product um, the best that we possibly can and also at the lowest possible price as well because it needs to be available for people. If it's too expensive and people can't afford it, it doesn't, this is a huge waste of time. While we're doing all that, we're doing all the lab work we're going, where we are going to be creating our own reference materials. So we've already created an ultra pure 99 plus percent arenosine A analytical standard. Uh, we did that in our lab with the Buki equipment we talked about. We've also made a couple other compounds. I'm looking at the board in my office right now that has them written up on there. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm supposed to tip my hand as to which ones they are, so I won't say their names, but we have another standard already made at about 95 plus percent purity, and we're working on standard number three and four uh, as we speak. So um, that said, after we grow and optimize and determine all the conditions, then we will take those growth conditions and that specific strain of mushroom and we will commercialize it and grow it at scale. Um, we think this is going to be a big product because it's going to be properly analytically measured using in-house reference materials that, as far as I know, we're the only lab in the world that actually has them. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, will, um, we will be the only ones capable of even measuring these compounds, let, al let alone standardizing an actual commercial product to these compounds. And uh, there's tons of research on these compounds. Um, they do lots of really helpful things for humans, and so we're really excited to, to make that happen. And I don't know what the time scale is for this, uh, if you ask the owner of the company, it's next year, next year, soon, right? But, I mean, science takes time. It's not unloading a truck, right? You can't just have more people go more faster, more better. Um, you have to do the experiments. They don't always succeed. They give you conflictory, conflicting data. Um, science is hard, so it takes time. Uh, in addition, then we have all the commercial stuff that we have to deal with as well. So, um, and then, of course, all of the, the manufacturing scale up and issues. So it's probably going to be a couple of years, quite frankly, but uh, I'm pushing every day to go as fast as I can with that. So. But at least we will uh, that said, some mycelium. Go ahead, sorry. At least we will have some mycelium ready that we can test for arenosine A much sooner than that. Uh, Jay yep. is more talking about like being able to determine what's in the fruiting bodies. And so we really love the fruiting bodies. Uh, the mycelium is kind of a new area we're going into. We actually have a production batch in-house. Um, this is, if you're listening to this, this is the first time you're ever hearing that. This is a, a bit of a crazy spoiler uh, kind of moment. Uh, we have that in-house. We have been able to verify that it has a renosine A. I think that might be one of the first times anyone has really confirmed that a mycelium product is containing arenosine A. I think one interesting thing that has come out of this too is 
we have tested quite a few mycelium on grain product, including one that I created myself. So I took some of the cultures and I inoculated grains with it to make grain spawn. And then we actually just tested a bunch of that grain spawn, like a few kilos. We didn't find any Arensin A as far as I can remember. Uh, I think we've also tested some commercially available um, mycelium on grain products. And I don't think we have found anything there either. So I think having my lion's mane mycelium is not necessarily going to guarantee that you are getting a renesine and I think that's an important question that needed to be answered. In order to get actual renesine A content, you have to do a liquid culture mycelium and a liquid culture mycelium grown with a very specific broth. We have also done some of this. I have made my own liquid culture, brought that into the lab, and we did actually determine that there was a renesine A in there. So we've been able to produce it ourselves too. And now we're working together with someone who has massive bioreactors who's been able to scale up this process and generate actual mycelium that is submerged culture. So it's being grown in a liquid medium, it's being removed from there, it's being dried, and then we have this. So a really crazy process, really difficult, taking a long time, one, to make the reference standard, two, to actually be able to get liquid culture mycelium at a very high commercial level. So, Jay, do you want to uh, maybe uh, give the surprise? What is the number we have found so far uh, for arenosine A in this uh, mycelium? So the material is specified to be no less than 0.5% arenosine A, which for a compound that generally exists in low single-digit PPM, high triple-digit PPB levels uh, in the mycelium is a really high level. We're talking mass percent, right? So not parts per million, not parts per thousand, um, but parts per 10, parts per 100 in the, in the mass percent ranges. So the spec is for 0.5% and our current QC batch is 0.8%. So, so almost and, 1%. And this is not an extract, by the way. So just raw mycelium. Imagine what we can do once we enhance our extraction uh, capabilities. Yeah, and we optimize the growth conditions for our strain of interest that we have. Yeah, it's, I'm very excited for it. I, I hope we can really make it happen. I hope that all the, the so finance and the logistics work out. Absolutely. It's super exciting. And that's just mycelium. I think, to me, personally, um, the fruiting bodies are more interesting and the stuff we are doing with fruiting bodies. You got a bias, fruiting body bias. I have a bias. <laughs> I, I love growing the lion's mane uh, and I love that we are now growing 21 different cultivars of lion's mane. I think in our first flush, we will be in the tens of pounds range uh, of fresh mushroom material, which unfortunately none of us will probably get to consume. We will uh, be submitting it to the lab and doing extraction work on it. And we might be able to pull a sample and ship it to you. <laughs> I'd like to try some. Uh, <laughs> but what were you going to say, Erica? Well, I was going to say, speaking of growing conditions, mm -hmm. Perhaps it's time to show everyone what yeah. you've been working on with the Mushroom Kingdom, um, a project that you sure. started together uh, with together Jay. with Jay. Yeah, we had a really we we had a weekly mushroom meeting, and for how long was it? Maybe a, almost a year. I was growing uh, lion's mane at our place in Phoenix, um, doing all of the the kind of microbiology work, getting the the cultures and putting the cultures on a petri dish and making the grain spawn and inoculating substrate bags and growing some lion's mane that we were extracting in the lab. And then we had a weekly mushroom meeting and we were thinking we need more fresh fruit and body material. Where are we going to get it? And then Jay and I kind of came up with the bit of a devious and crazy idea to why not <laughs> it ourselves. It's pretty great to think yeah. about. I mean, if you, if you want something done right, you got to do it yourself, you know? Don't yeah. forget you were growing it at your desk pre-pandemic. Pre yeah, that too. So we've been doing it for years already, actually. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so from yeah. the grow box on your desk, which was years ago, mm -hmm. to our house in Phoenix, mm -hmm. now the project has migrated to its current uh, glorious form, which is the Mushroom Kingdom. Which is something, uh, that was Jay's name, uh, so he gets... <laughs> <laughs> Don't sue me, Nintendo. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so, so it's time, I think. It's time to take a look. I, what I'm going to do is try and sign into the software uh, on uh, 
on my phone and then that way I can take you guys with uh, to the lobby where we actually grow the mushrooms and you can see uh, both where it's at and kind of how we do it and as well as the stage that they're currently in. We have not yet collected our first flush um, but we did uh, what is it called when you open the bags when you slice them? Emil, is there a name for that process where you yes. just allow them? I think slicing, opening it, opening it up, like basically, and you'll see how it looks in the grow chamber. But what we are doing is we are basically making an artificial log. There's actually also sawdust in these bags, um, and out of a log you would normally get a small uh, aberration, and that's where the lion's mane would grow out of on a tree trunk. So we are replicating that process indoors in a laboratory kind of environment. And to simulate that process, we just take a knife and we cut gently into the bag. Uh, and then there's a small spot where the lion's mane mycelium can then actually sense a very moist environment with oxygen in there. Because interestingly enough, unlike plants, which um, take in CO2 and expel O2, mushrooms do the reverse and are much like us. They take in O2 and they expel CO2. So if they sense an O2 rich environment, and strangely enough, even though they're not photosynthetic, mushrooms do need a little bit of a light source to be able to uh, grow towards it. But when they detect humid air, oxygen, and a light source, and a little slit to grow through, because obviously they can't just grow through plastic, then they will just start spouting out as if it's coming through a tree. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to sign out of this software real quick and sign in from my phone, and then we'll take a walk over to the Mushroom Kingdom. Awesome. Can you see okay? Yeah. So we have yeah. to have a constant supply of fresh air and water. So we have a water bucket that feeds from an RO system via the blue line and this giant fan to pump air according to the humidity conditions, which are controlled by the Inkbird controller. Um, pulling samples, keeping track of the data, you know, normal sciencey stuff. All the stuff over here, I think this is probably IPA, yep, for keeping stuff clean. We have this grow tent, which it might be difficult to see the scale, but it's, uh, is it 10 by 10, Emil? 10 by 10 by 8, I believe? Uh, yeah, I believe that's it. It's, if any of you are interested, it is the grow tent on the AC Infinity site. So, yeah. yeah, so it's AC Infinity. It has a neat little controller. Track temperature. And this is the inside of the tent and the bags inside the Mushroom Kingdom. Oh, wow, look at 7B going nuts. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so that might be so, one of our uh, cultivars. Yeah, so if you look at uh, 3A, for example, like look at the structure here of 3A compared to 3B, oh, yeah. right? Oh, that's so uh, an E coral to the pattern. Can you see? Yeah. Yes, okay. and we're actually... So we're growing different cultivars, but we're also growing yep. completely different species. So we're doing yep. mostly Heritium erinaceus, which is lion's mane, but then we're also doing, for example, Heritium coralloides, which is the coral tooth fungus. Mm. Uh, and we're also doing some really more rare ones, like uh, I believe it is Heritium, uh, it's a hard one, Keralta, I think. It, it, it has a very strange growing pattern. So we're seeing, is there in any of the other Heritium species, do we see similar types of compounds? Do we actually see... This guy looks pretty cool. Compounds or different concentrations? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah that one. <laughs> what uh, species or cultivar is that? Uh, this is uh, Lion's Mane, but I don't know what MEH30 is. I have to check the logs to see what uh, cultivar it is. Mm -hmm. Look at the structure of that guy. Oh, wow. There it looks quite dense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, lion's mane I mean, is it's kind of dense, but it's not. Take a bite. Yeah. <laughs> and this guy, look at that. He's got like a pinkish color. Yeah, yeah. I've seen that happen before. Uh, it's kind of unknown, I, I think, what causes that. Sometimes it's maybe... That one is really sensitive to uh, the different levels of oxygen and CO2 and airflow and uh, humidity, and, and others are not. I believe, in general, the pinkish color is not fantastic. So this tells us something, too. If we have a bunch of different lion's mane um, and other heritium species all growing together in the same environment, and one of them is showing a more pinkish color, and others are 
they're growing more vigorously, then we can maybe use the other cultivars over that one because that one might just be a little bit more sensitive to normal conditions. And we want things that are not sensitive, that are not going to get contaminated, that are not going to have issues that, that are easier to mass produce, easier to mass produce, easier to create as much biomass as possible with as much bioactives as possible. So that's kind of what we're looking for and hunting for here. Anything else you guys want to see before I leave the kingdom? I think uh, we've seen some really interesting examples and I'm happy to actually see that it's a little bit more tracking to, to once things start growing that everything goes well and you don't have contaminations. But if you're doing things properly, which we're doing things Properly, we're doing things following the science, uh, following um, good sterile technique. You can't be 100% sterile, of course, but being as mindful as possible of contamination. We're doing that. We've got all of the environmental parameters perfectly dialed in. So now it's really up to the different lion's mane, Heritium erinaceus cultivars, and the different Heritium species. Another one we're doing, for example, is Heritium americana. Americanus or Americana? Do you remember, Jay? No, I. there's over yeah. 21 different strains. I can't keep track of them all. I have also the, all the other Latin botanicals for all the other things I got to keep track of. So I rely on records for that. <laughs> Thanks, Jay, for showing us the tent and running us through all of the, the tiger milk research development we needed to do to actually come out with a tiger milk product. And once this phone call is over, we will really dive deep into what it is doing, our experience with it. We'll give you kind of a status report since we took it earlier to see what it's doing to us. Um, and we'll kind of go from there and look at a little bit more talk about. But now you have a really good idea of some of the science behind it, how complex it can be to come out with a product. And now we've kind of um, hopefully increased your appetite a little bit for lion's mane. I know a lot of you have been asking about lion's mane, where we are at with the lion's mane. Now you see it's a big project. We are actively working on it and it will take a while, uh, but once it is there, we will have a really interesting product. And I think we will have some interesting research to share with kind of the, the entire functional mushroom space because as far as I'm aware, no one's really delved into the science. There are some phenomenal cultivators in the US and there are people who have looked at the genetics and have gone out into the forest and, and really taken lion's mane off of trees and cloned them and then be able to replicate them. And then that's actually some of the, the cultivars we're growing, they're coming straight out of the wild. Like we have a, a few cultivars that are coming from Virginia, in Pennsylvania that have been gathered in the wild, have then been stabilized in the lab, have then made it over to us, and now we are growing those wild varieties in a lab. Um, so then we can see maybe different parts of the world. I know there's also some interesting species of uh, Heritium in um, New Zealand. I would love to get my hands on that. We weren't able to get actually a liquid culture this round, maybe at some point, maybe we will have to go over there and clone it ourselves. But we are really looking at everything and building on that amazing mushroom science that has been here in the Western world in the US, but mostly all of that knowledge that's in Asia. And that's, I think, where a lot of the mushroom knowledge comes from. It's where the, the master cultivators of the world are. They're doing stuff I cannot even fathom. It's, it's crazy. They're starting from nothing, sometimes in really rudimentary settings they're able to grow phenomenal mushrooms um, if you look around on youtube there's some crazy stuff you can see there uh, but building off of that building off some of the genetic work that's being done and i think now we're in the next step where we're getting really a, a microscopic look into the the science into what's actually there and jay is a big part of that and some other people that are not on this um, um, 
I asked them, they didn't want to be on the camera. Yeah. <laughs> I will have to give a few shout outs. Robert, of course, he is doing a lot of the, the actual uh, taking bioactives out of these mushrooms and concentrating them. Yep. And then Trevor is overseeing a lot of the, the growing. So I think those are two really important players here too, who are working their yep. asses off behind the scenes to make sure that we understand what's in lion's mane. Yep. Yeah, well said. Um, really excited both for the new product that should be coming out in the next couple months, probably, if I had to guess, as well as for our custom product that we make using the sum of all the knowledge and research we've been doing for years now and will continue to do. Um, that product is going to be, I really think it's going to be life-changing for a lot of people, and I'm hoping parts, members of my family can have their life changed by it as well. Awesome. Well, thanks, Jay. Yeah. Pleasure chatting. All right, guys. Well, it's good to see you. We'll talk on Skype. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. That was awesome to talk with Jay about the Mushroom Project. Absolutely. So I think we all have a lot more information now about the um, cultivation process of lion's mane and of tiger milk mushroom. Now you've had a chance to see all of the different varieties of lion's mane that we're growing in the mushroom kingdom, mm -hmm. which is super cool. And we also know a little bit more about what makes tiger milk mushroom special and how we're standardizing for these beta-glucans um, in our tiger milk mushroom supplement. And basically the intense amount of work and detail and specificity that goes into every single product from Nootropics Depot. Absolutely. And that kind of brings us now to the actual effects. So we've really talked about the history, the cultivation, the, the lab testing, all of that. But the real important thing that we're interested in here is the effects. And I think now that the tiger milk mushroom has had a little bit more time to kick in, I think we can give you some of our thoughts about what it's doing. Absolutely. So right now, as I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, I've been having some seasonal allergies. The pollen count is really high here. I can feel like I am breathing a little bit deeper right now. And I feel like maybe my voice isn't as hoarse anymore, but we'll have to listen back in the recordings. It feels a little bit easier to talk. Um, feels a little bit easier to breathe. I feel a little bit more energetic too, and a little bit more focused, which I don't necessarily have good answers to why that's happening. But if you look at the traditional uses of it, one of the uses actually is to enhance energy levels. So um, traditionally, a small amount of it would be consumed with a bit of water and then it would suppress your appetite. You wouldn't be hungry for most of the day and you would have a nice amount of energy. Unsurprisingly, it was then also used as kind of a hunting aid. So you take it, you go out hunting. You see this very often. For example, in uh, South Africa, you see it with canna. Um, the, the hunters would use the canna, they would chew on the canna and then that would give them more endurance, it would suppress their appetite, it would kind of give them a keener insight into hunting. And I think, interestingly enough, this is where a lot of um, our knowledge of certain botanicals comes from. It comes from hunting as well. Like, um, there is a really good small documentary, it's actually on Vimeo too, it's definitely worth checking out. It's called The Spirit Hunters. They kind of go over some of the botanicals they're using in a Peruvian uh, tribe um, to kind of enhance their, their ability to hunt. Same thing here, it was being used to hunt, kind of used to enhance uh, endurance, energy levels and cognitive function, of course. Um, so that's kind of what I'm noticing now, but definitely the respiratory thing. I, I notice that every, always when I take it, uh, especially now at double the dose, I actually think I might try double the dose for a few days because 300 milligrams is a very efficacious dose. There is human clinical trials on this dose. Uh, and it works really well, but I think for those slightly more acute effects, I am liking a double dose. So Me too. Maybe we should try that for the next couple of days. Definitely. I would like to take a double dose because the perceptible effects that I can sense now are, are much more obvious to me um, compared to just a single capsule dose. And the main effect that I'm noticing is an increase in focus. Mm -hmm. It's definitely not... Um, a like stimulating sense of focus no, no, but no. it's really calm it's really balanced and i feel like in general it's helping me to 
just stay engaged with our conversation. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't feel like something that would necessarily make it difficult to uh, like go into a different kind of activity. Like it feels like a very flexible focus. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it complements really well with the rest of my stack also. We both took our full stack today, mm -hmm. which included a single capsule of tiger milk mushroom. But I think in general, this increase in focus is more prominent to me than the energy boost, but I also do notice that when my energy starts to dip, that's certainly when my focus dips as well. So I think these things go hand in hand. And I also think that the respiratory benefits are contributing to that feeling of more focus as well. Um, do I you do notice it now at double the dose? I still don't notice it specifically, Okay. but that might be because I do a lot of activities um, on a daily basis where I am consciously focusing on my breathing. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when I'm in yoga or if I'm singing or if I'm practicing an instrument, I'm really thinking to myself to feel my lungs, to feel the air going in, you know, at the back of my throat and down and using my entire uh, strength of my diaphragm to breathe. And while we're talking on a podcast, I don't have enough bandwidth to really think about those details. But I know from all of this kind of focused um, breathing practice that the more I am conscious of my breathing, the more focused I can be. And it goes the other way too. The better my breathing is, the more focused I can be on the task at hand. And I think that even though I can't sense the, the breath part, it's happening for sure, because that's something that's helping me to stay focused and really in the zone. Absolutely. It's something I'm noticing here too. And, and like you said, the, the focus seems like you can kind of apply it in different areas. It feels very natural to me. And that's something I notice with a lot of the mushrooms, like the calming effects of the red reishi, especially the ultra potent red reishi. It's really natural. It's, it's like it's coming from within me rather than if I'm taking lemon balm or magnolia bark or something like that. I can really notice a, a, a robust calming effect that seems exogenous. Yes. When it comes to the ultra potent red reishi, it seems like it's more my own body producing that, even though clearly there are bioactives floating around in my system that is mm -hmm. producing that effect. Absolutely. Do you also feel that way when you take lion's mane mushroom? So I'm strangely enough not uh, a very major responder to lion's mane. I've had a few experiences with lion's mane where it was really noticeable for me. So for example, one time I had a whole fresh fruiting body, like a really big one, probably weighed close to like half a kilo or so. Is this the one you grew at home? Uh, it was not one I grew at home, actually. It was a mushroom grower in town in Phoenix called Southwest Mushrooms, okay. a fantastic uh, mushroom grower. He brought in some lion's mane one day, the owner, and we were kind of just like, what happens if we just eat it? So um, the owner of Nootropics Depot and I, we just ate a whole lion's mane and I felt something maybe somewhat similar to what I'm feeling now, kind of this natural sharp focus effect, okay. which I really liked and a nice mood boost. Other than that, I don't notice a whole lot acutely from uh, lion's mane. Um, I don't know why I've taken high doses of other lion's mane. Maybe this uh, experiment with the fresh lion's mane fruiting body was also the fact that it was just an exciting day and we did something really unusual. So maybe that's why I got some of these effects. Maybe there are some uh, volatile compounds in lion's mane that are not there anymore after it's been dried. I'm not totally sure what happened there, but normally I don't notice a whole lot from lion's mane acutely, but I notice it long term. And compared to tiger milk, is this mm -hmm. a lot stronger of an acute effect? This, for me, this is way stronger. And okay. I think this is kind of where things get really interesting because a lot of people have really strong responses to lion's mane. I've heard okay. so many stories, and especially with our lion's mane, that people have really profound responses to it. And it always surprises me just because I myself don't notice a whole lot from lion's mane. 
But clearly there are people out there where it is completely life-changing. I mean, Lion's Mane is one of our top selling mushroom products. It is one of the top selling mushroom products just in general in the functional mushroom space. And of course, there is a lot of marketing that has gone on for Lion's Mane. I think Paul Stamets plays a big role in there. He's a big proponent of Lion's Mane. So it certainly has some hype and notoriety behind it. But that always will die out at a certain point if it isn't producing real tangible effects. So I think for the majority of people, Lion's Mane has a really profound effect. What I'm experiencing with tiger milk mushroom is what I imagine other people experience with lion's mane. I'm curious to know then, for anyone who is a regular um, lion's mane user fan, um, what has your experience been taking lion's mane in comparison with tiger milk mushroom? Do you feel like they have um, different acute effects? Do you feel like they're similar? Um, if you take one and then the other, what are the differences and how about the combination together? Um, I would love to know what your experience has been and if you want to share, definitely go to our subreddit, that's r slash Nootropics Depot, and tell us what your experience has been with Tiger Milk Mushroom in comparison with Lion's Mane. I think this will be really curious uh, for us to read as well as everyone who's on the subreddit because there's so many different functional mushrooms that are becoming more popular, um, that people are becoming familiar with, and as you start to take more, you're going to be able to tell the subtle differences between them, or perhaps not so subtle. Yeah. So definitely share that with us. Uh, we would love to read it and get your experience, especially if there's more people like Emil who are non-responders to lion's mane or perhaps even to tiger milk. We're all different, so our experiences can vary and it's really helpful to see all the variety because then it can help people understand their experience a little bit better and perhaps try something new. Absolutely. Um, but when the reason why we are making comparisons between lion's mane and tiger milk in the first place, of course, we can, uh, we're not making that comparison just because it is a mushroom. Like I would never compare cordyceps and lion's mane kind of in the same breath and say they have the same effect. So the thing that's unique about tiger milk mushroom and lion's mane is that they are both acting on nerve growth factor but to th two different pathways. So with lion's mane, lion's mane, the various compounds in there, so especially in the mycelium, and as we talked about in the uh, call with Jay, we will be coming out with a mycelium product that has arenosine A in there in the very near future. Arenosine A actually stimulates the production of nerve growth factor. The hericinones in um, lion's mane actually make us more sensitive to the effects of NGF. So I also think it will be very interesting once we have a, a renosine A lion's mane product, which is enhancing NGF synthesis, to combine it with the lion's mane fruiting bodies, which make us more sensitive to the effects of NGF, and especially to combine it with uh, tiger milk mushroom because tiger milk mushrooms does something completely different. Instead of relying on it to, uh, to increase NGF levels, it is acting like NGF. So it's acting like an NGF mimetic. It can bind to the TRKA receptor, the tropomyosin kinase A receptor. That's the receptor that NGF, nerve growth factor, binds to to produce its effects. So it's really interesting if we can bind something else on the TRKA receptor and produce similar effects to NGF, but without having to rely on boosting NGF. Absolutely. Does that also mean that then there is more NGF in our system that can be used for other purposes or once the tiger milk has been metabolized? In theory, yeah, they, it would maybe free up NGF, but one of the main reasons we want NGF is for it to work on the TRKA receptor. Okay. Um, but if we're combining something that mimics the effects of NGF with NGF, and especially with something that makes the effects of NGF uh, or TRKA stimulation more effective, like the hericinones in the lion's pain fruiting body, then all of them will have a synergistic effect. Okay. So we will get the most amount of NGF activity. And I think that's what will be one of the big appeals with tiger milk, lion's mane and lion's mane mycelium in the future is to combine them into different formulas and stacks focused on NGF. 
This kind of um, focus from within and this subtle energy boost seems to be kind of common amongst supplements that are working with NGF. Uh, so NGF and BDNF. So another one that you notice kind of similar effects profile with is with things that act on BDNF or are acting as BDNF mimetics. So for example, 7,8-DHF, 7,8-dihydroxyflavone, uh, which is another product we carry. It is doing a very similar thing to whatever is in tiger milk mushroom that is pulling off this effect. It is going to be binding to the TRKB receptor in a very similar way as BDNF, and it's going to mimic the effects of BDNF without having to elevate BDNF. And in people who are taking 7-8-DHF, they are not noticing as much of a focusing effect. They're noticing more of a mood boosting, uh, kind of introspective kind of effect, um, an effect that may be a little bit on on. The, the microdosing type of effects like that you get with uh, Cognance. Um, so with NGF, like you were saying, indeed, it does seem like there is more of like a focus enhancing effect. With Lion's Man, there's a focus enhancing effect. There's also a big mood enhancing effect. There's a good effect on um, nerve pain and things like that. So NGF is really important. It, it helps our nerves regrow. Uh, it helps proliferate new nerves. It works together with BDNF to enhance neuroplasticity. I think it's really interesting to have both of them there and, and definitely seems to be a bit of a focusing effect to it. I've tried doing research into why that is, but the TRKA, NGF, the whole neurotrophin system is very complex. It seems like maybe there is some norepinephrine activity going on there too. And if I would have to guess kind of on some of the respiratory effects, like uh, allowing me to breathe a little bit deeper, it almost feels like it has a bit of a bronchodilator effect. There might be a, a norepinephrine component there, but like we've mentioned throughout this podcast, the science on tiger milk mushroom is young. The human experience with tiger milk mushroom certainly is not young. We've been using it for over 400 years. It is considered to be the national treasure of Malaysia. Um, it's very famous there. Uh, it will become more famous in the Western world, I I'm sure, uh, with us being one of the first functional mushroom uh, providers, vendors to carry this. I think it will snowball a little bit. You'll probably see it from other vendors in the future. Uh, and if not, then you know we're we're the main source, which I think is really interesting, because it has such a unique effect. Like this is giving me everything I've always wanted from Lion's Mane, but I've never completely been able to reap from Lion's Mane. Another important thing to keep in mind with Lion's Mane is that Lion's Mane contains compounds which act on the kappa opioid receptor, and they act there as an agonist. For some people, this is really beneficial for um, nerve pain, for general pain management, but activating the kappa opioid receptor also can produce a little bit of a negative mood effect in some. Mm. In some though, agonizing the kappa opioid receptor and over time downregulating it a little bit can actually have a really profound mood boosting effect. So it can kind of go either way. I'm neutral in that sense. I don't necessarily notice much of a mood boost from uh, Lion's Mane or a, a negative uh, mood effect, but some people really have this kind of weird underwater type of effect. It seems like some people are quite sensitive to the effects of kappa opioid agonism, in which case with tiger milk mushroom, you get many of those same Lion's Mane type of NGF mediated effects without the kappa opioid uh, mechanism, which makes it, I think, for people who are not reacting incredibly well to lion's mane, this would be a very nice product to, to try out. You're gonna get very similar benefits um, and you're gonna get some really unique respiratory benefits. And the very respiratory cool. benefits is really what tiger milk is famous for. So we should definitely chat a little bit about that. Absolutely. Um, I am curious to know just exactly how tiger milk is working to support respiration. Mm -hmm. And we talked a little bit about um, beta-glucans on the call mm -hmm. with Jay, but there's also a lot more that's in the tiger milk supplement um, that we might not be able to identify that's probably having some of these beneficial effects. Absolutely. So where is the respiratory support coming from? 
Well, it is going to come partially from the beta-glucans. Okay. The beta-glucans definitely are important there because the beta-glucans are really important for immune function. So okay. we have a bunch of different beta-glucan products. Of course, all of our mushrooms will have beta-glucans in there. So beta-glucans make up the cell wall of um, uh, mushrooms, specifically in the form of chitin, which is an indigestible beta-glucan, but in a lot of our uh, extracts we do break that down uh, and, and then have that chitin turns into beta-glucans but beta-glucans make up the cellular structure of a lot of different mushrooms. So and then in this case they're also making up the structure of the sclerotium. Of the sclerotium, correct. Okay. So beta-glucans are there in all mushrooms and all mushrooms have to a certain degree really excellent immune function elevating effects. Now, if you look at, for example, yeasts, yeast cell walls are also made up of beta-glucans. So okay. if you look at Epicor or if you look at our functional yeast extract, it is also standardized for beta-glucans. So you're also getting those immune modulating beta-glucans. So the beta-glucans are important in general for the immune regulating effects of tiger milk mushroom and because our immune system in our lungs, in our respiratory system is very important. Just boosting general um, immune function there is important. But of course, you can do that with other mushrooms. So there seems to be something interesting going on. There appear to be some high molecular weight proteins that are present in um, the tiger milk mushroom that might have some specifically beneficial effects there. there. Seem to be some fatty acids that have a beneficial effect. We're not exactly sure. What we are sure of, though, is that it works because there is a human clinical trial on it. So this is something that we don't always get the luxury of having. Um, but specifically with tiger milk mushroom, it was deemed important enough in Malaysia that resources were allocated to running fairly um, large human clinical trials on the effects on respiratory function. So we know that in humans, it is producing a positive effect on respiratory function. One of the things found in this study was that participants who were taking uh, tiger milk mushroom had almost doubled the level of immunoglobulin A, IgA. Yeah, IgA, immunoglobulin A. So this is a very specific um, compound which helps enhance the immune function of our lungs, of our respiratory system, and it kind of acts as a first line of defense. So that's a really um, beneficial effect of tiger milk mushroom. What compound it's coming from, we're not totally sure. It could be some unique beta-glucan in there or another type of compound, but that's uh, one effect that it has. So it's okay. enhancing one, just generally it's enhancing our immune function through the beta-glucans, and then specifically it's enhancing immunoglobulin A, which is acting as a first line of defense for our respiratory system. And then it is lowering the level of two cytokines. So cytokines is probably something we have all become somewhat familiar with, uh, with recent world events, um, with cytokine storm. I think that is maybe a term that rings a bell. So cytokines are not good for your respiratory function and can cause inflammation and oxidation throughout our respiratory tract. So we want lower cytokine levels, especially the inflammatory and pro-oxidative uh, cytokines. And two of those are interleukin 1 beta and interleukin 8. And in this human clinical trial, it was found that interleukin 8 and interleukin 1 beta were reduced, and those are really important. Well, they are really negative um, interleukins, cytokines in our respiratory tract. So being able to dampen the level of those helps reduce inflammation in our lungs and oxidation in our lungs, and that will have a beneficial effect on respiratory function. Okay. Again, this doesn't necessarily explain the acute effects on respiratory function. So really, I'm sitting here and I'm going, breathing in, and it feels like I can breathe in a little bit deeper. It, it feels somewhat bronchodilatory. I really am not sure what's happening there. I've heard it from a few other people, um, but some people like you don't notice it as much. So I'm not sure what's going on there, um, but that is probably not necessarily coming from the interleukin-8 and interleukin-1-beta and IgA effect. 
might be coming from somewhere else. It might have something to do with NGF even, with uh, TRKA. Yeah. It's interesting nonetheless. Again, there are just some things we don't necessarily know yet about tiger milk mushroom, but we do have some human clinical trials and 400 years of human experience with it showing that it's really beneficial for overall respiratory function. So I think for there, it's, it's a fascinating mushroom. Absolutely. As we've been talking about this a little mm -hmm. bit more, and um, I've been listening to you talk about these mechanisms, one thing that did stand out to me about a week ago, mm -hmm. um, we were already taking the tiger milk mushroom. Mm -hmm. I was, um, I had a long day after uh, not very much sleep, and I had a moment where I felt really, really tired. And in that moment, I thought to myself, if I just breathe as deeply as possible, get as much oxygen to my brain, perhaps this will help wake me up a little bit. Um, and when I started to really focus on my breathing, one thing I noticed was that I could feel the air going into my lungs in the back of my throat. Mm -hmm. And I could sense that cool air moving through um, more of like my sinus area and my throat for the first time. Mm -hmm. I had never felt that kind of uh, sort of cool breeze feeling in this part of my body before, um, but I didn't necessarily associate it with uh, tiger milk mushroom because I thought I'm doing this consciously, I'm focused on my breathing, so this must be something that, that I'm doing just myself. Mm -hmm. But perhaps I never would have even had that thought or that sensation if it weren't for the fact that I had been taking tiger milk mushroom. So when I talk about the being able to breathe deeper effect, I don't necessarily have the, the terminology you have. You're like you mentioned, breathing is a thing that's more important in your professional life. Mm -hmm. So I think you have better words to describe it, but that is what I notice. Okay. When I breathe in, it's like a rush of cool air that I can feel in my throat, that I can feel filling my lungs. It's something I wouldn't normally notice unless I'm taking tiger milk mushroom and I really notice it with a double dose. Mm -hmm. I really notice it the first time I t took it. And I'm sure if I wasn't experiencing seasonal allergies at the moment, like right now my nose is really itchy, my eyes are a little bit itchy, I'm blinking a little bit more, I'm, my, my breathing is a little bit being restricted for like the last month or so, I would notice it even more. Mm -hmm. But even through that, I can notice that I can just breathe a little bit deeper. I feel a little bit maybe more energized because of that too. So yeah. and that's a really interesting thing to keep in mind with tiger milk mushroom. It is really like a stimulator and protector of our respiratory function. I really love talking with you about the effects of supplements because oftentimes we have um, a similar uh, sensation, but the way that we describe it is from like opposite sides. Yes. And I think that makes it really fun because we learn something from each other, but we also can start to feel or sense the connections um, that each experience has with the other. Mm -hmm. So one thing I also wanted to talk about, which I noticed was the digestion benefits, because mm -hmm. that was something that felt um, really noticeable pretty much within the first few days of taking tiger milk okay. mushroom. That was one of the first effects that I had from just the single capsule dose. It could also be that we have been taking cyanidin 3 glucoside and those metabolic effects might be kicking in a little bit harder for you now. Mm -hmm. So that might be a confounding factor. Um, if that is not a confounding factor, the one thing I can imagine is that because of those effects on interleukin 1 beta and in interleukin 8, that that can have a inflammation dampening effect in your gastrointestinal system and that could be helping. So that can definitely be there. And I think that also is an interesting thing to mention that interleukin-8 and interleukin-1-beta, but specifically interleukin-8 is present in your brain and forms a, a big part of the, the collective experience of neuroinflammation. And a lot of people seem to kind of uh, correlate neuroinflammation and brain fog. So maybe that's another thing. I do feel just generally mentally a little bit more clear headed. Um, not, I'm taking a lot of different things that have effects on neuroinflammation like long vita. So maybe if I wasn't taking long vita, that effect would be even a little bit more pronounced. But I think that might be part of the effects profile of tiger milk mushroom too, that 
TRKA NGF mimetic effect and then an inflammation and oxidation reducing effect in the brain. Add some mental clarity, which is also helping in the respiratory tract and it's also helping in our gastrointestinal tract. The inflammation support from tiger milk mushroom was really noticeable for me because it helped me deal with um, discomfort with gas after eating. Interesting. It was something that really stood out to me um, within the first couple of days. And for anyone who deals with um, frequent gas or even just stomach cramps, it can be really uncomfortable and it can make um, just eating different kinds of foods not fun at all and it can make dining a little bit more difficult so if you have those issues or if you are searching for supplements to um, help mitigate that issue perhaps tiger milk could help you because this was something that is a really um, annoying part of my almost everyday life and i have not been dealing with that issue as much since starting to take tiger milk. And again, I do think cyanidin 3 glucoside might be a confounding factor there because recently there have been a bunch of posts on our subreddit of people who have started to take cyanidin 3 glucoside and who have had constant issues with bloating and with gas and gastrointestinal function who have said there's been nothing better than cyanidin 3 glucoside mm. for them and that they're getting uh, sinking poop, which I guess is a good thing. Uh, oh. Something they say they haven't experienced in a long time and now they're experiencing with cyanidin 3 glucoside. So okay. I think cyanidin 3 glucoside is a very powerful one for just general overall, for general overall uh, gastrointestinal function. So Okay, That's I think good to know. maybe it's the cyanidin 3 glucoside, maybe it's the tiger milk, maybe it is an interaction between the tiger milk and the cyanidin 3 glucoside. Because I also know, for example, that with Epicor and with the functional yeast extract, which is really high in beta glucans too, people have reported very beneficial gastrointestinal effects. I am just remembering that now. So it could be that. Cyanidin 3 glucoside got you most of the way there, and then now you're getting this effect of the, the beta glucans in here and maybe some other effects. But maybe it's just the beta glucans. Yeah, so it could, that be. could be very interesting. Yeah. In terms of beta glucans, um, is red reishi a really big container, or is, is that one of the main parts of the benefits of red reishi mushroom? Not the one we were taking, not the ultra-potent okay. red reishi. So the ultra-potent red reishi, the main thing in there is the ganoderic acids. Yes. Um, and to obtain such high levels of ganoderic acids, we have gotten rid of a lot of the beta-glucans. Okay. But if you're taking the one-to-one -one reishi, there are a lot of beta-glucans in there. Okay, but that's good to know. Apparently, actually, uh, tiger milk and red reishi are somewhat closely related. Yeah. Okay. So, the reason why I asked is because as we were talking about um, the cyanidin 3 glucoside benefits for gastrointestinal function, mm -hmm. I was trying to eliminate any other potential um, overlaps with beta glucans. Mm -hmm. And if I think about the mushrooms that we are taking um, in our daily supplement stack, red reishi definitely comes to mind. But now that I'm reminded of the um, ganoderic acids, mm -hmm. that that's causing the effects. Now I do feel even more strongly that tiger milk is having a beneficial effect for gastrointestinal function because I know that this is what's providing those beta glucans in my daily stack. Yes. Okay. And we, you are currently not taking the ultra potent red reishi. Okay. So that's something we, we share a very similar stack and I know for sure that we haven't had the ultra potent red reishi. We actually scrubbed it out of our stack. So that hasn't been part of our stack for uh, at least a month, if not two months at this point. So we can completely eliminate it then. You from can completely the eliminate variables. it. You yeah, haven't okay. been taking uh, the ultra potent red reishi. Okay. Um, so this is currently the only mushroom that is in our stack. Okay. We do actually consume quite a lot of dietary mushrooms. We really like the taste of mushrooms. We have a really good source for mushrooms here. On, for any of you that are in the Amsterdam area, go to the Nordermarkt. There's a mushroom stand there. They have all the mushrooms of your dreams there. They have some really amazing stuff, some amazing wild mushrooms and a lot of cultivated mushrooms, a lot of different varieties. So we do eat dietary mushrooms at least once or twice a week. Absolutely. 
um, but we're not taking any supplemental mushrooms except now for tiger milk mushrooms. So that's really interesting. And yeah, uh, if, if you haven't necessarily noticed the gastrointestinal effects when we were taking the ultra potent red reishi, I do think that your analysis still holds because now this is one of the first times where you're taking a really high beta glucan mushroom. Because normally when we take the mushroom extracts, we're taking the hydroethanolic ones like the cordyceps 10 to 1 or the lion's mane 8 to 1 we took for a while or the ultra potent red rishis ones that are not as focused on beta glucans but this is 50 percent beta glucans so when you take a 300 milligram capsule of this you're getting 150 milligrams of beta glucans when we're taking now two capsules of it we've gotten 300 milligrams of beta glucans and with the dose this morning that means we have gotten 450 milligrams of beta glucans so quite a high beta glucan dose. Um, Absolutely. So if you have been noticing some positive effects uh, with that, especially later in the day, you'll know it's probably those beta glucans, specifically the beta glucans in tiger milk. Yes. To illustrate to you just how dramatic the benefit has been for me, taking tiger milk has been more powerful for uh, helping with my gastrointestinal discomfort than ginger and apigenin. And those are both really um, great and super useful for this purpose, but tiger milk really stood out to me even more than those two. Okay. Yeah. For me, I think over the long term, the, the first few days on tiger milk mushroom, the cognitive effects were a little bit milder. I think I've talked about that on Reddit too. But now that I'm kind of analyzing them, especially now with this double dose, I'm realizing that I have been more focused but I've been more direct. Like I can waffle on a little bit as maybe you've noticed on this uh, podcast, I can, I can really talk a lot, but sometimes I have a little bit of difficulty being a little bit more concise. And I feel like with the tiger milk mushroom, I can be a little bit more concise. I do have to rein myself in because I do think it can also come out a little bit like forceful, like a little bit unkind to, it, to a certain degree, like I'm a little bit too forward. Um, so that is something I have noticed. Like I feel a little bit more engaged. I feel a little bit more clear headed. Uh, I'm almost having this effect sometimes that, uh, which sounds not so nice, but with others around me, I'm like, Hey, come on, pick up the pace. Like we, like I'm feeling a little bit elevated now. And I feel like it's now an uneven playing field with, with certain people mm-hmm. kind of, I feel like I'm, a little bit more able to to squeeze out some extra performance now with the tiger milk mushroom. So it was subtle, but I'm noticing that over and over now where I feel a little bit more dialed in. I noticed Uh, that too. And perhaps you might be just slightly mm self-conscious about the the kindness or the (laughs) delivery, but I actually think that it's a great thing because I've definitely noticed you being more direct. Um, You are speaking clear it feels like you are more confident in the directions that you give. And for that reason, I actually think that has overall uh, a more kind effect. Okay. So that's good. Because it's helpful (laughs) and because it's clear and because it's strong. And I think you're someone who is really confident and especially in a podcast scenario, you have so much information to give. Um, But I can hear that the way that you're expressing Everything that we've talked about today is really clear. Um, It's a little bit more simple. It's like you've cut away the extra around the outside or kind of smooth the edges and that you're really dialed in and you know exactly what is important to share and what you need to focus on. And I think that makes the conversation and just, you know, your mood in general more pleasant. Okay. Interesting. It, that is exactly what I'm feeling. Like I'm just feeling a little bit more sharp. I'm feeling a little bit more clear headed. I'm feeling a little bit more confident. It's all little things, but it's stacking up. And now that I'm taking a double dose on top of my normal single dose, and we've been taking it for almost a week now, um, Friday will be a week. So that it's Thursday today. So tomorrow we will have been taking it for a week. Yeah, I notice a little bit more confidence. I notice a little bit more focus and I can be a little bit more concise. I feel like my writing ability is also really good. Like I was writing an email uh, today and it just, 
I was going fast and I was surprised at how much I wrote and how concise it was and how little I had to spell check uh, and it all flowed nicely. So, and, and I do think that kind of silver tongue effect that people talk about oftentimes with nootropics, I do think I'm getting it. It's easier to express myself. I've actually kind of been having a hard time since being back in the Netherlands. Um, I'm speaking a lot more Dutch now, which is my native language and I'm speaking less English and now I'm speaking a lot more Dutch and English and it's becoming a little bit more difficult to always be as fluent and as uh, quick with English. Uh, so I'm noticing that silver tongued effect a little bit more with the tiger milk mushroom now because I don't have to think as much about my English words and the internal Dutch English translation that's going on. So it, it's a really nice effect to have. I feel more confident in my ability to speak and it's coming out more fluently. So that's, I think, a really nice effect that that's having. That's really cool. I'm currently learning Dutch, although I can't say that it's had that tiger milk has had such a prominent effect on my language learning, but in general, it's made me feel more comfortable and more confident um, just adjusting to a new culture and certainly a different lifestyle mm -hmm. and all of the changes that we've been going through over the last couple of months. Yeah, but I think effects wise, that about wraps it up for tiger milk. Absolutely. It's really clearly, it's quite comprehensive in our lives. Yes. It's touching on a lot of different things. I think it's definitely worth trying out for that reason, especially if you're not a great responder to lion's mane, or if you are a great responder to lion's mane, I bet it will stack really nicely with lion's mane, kind of enhancing the overall more cognitive effects, the speech effects, the respiratory effects, the confidence effects, the focus effects, the gastrointestinal effects, the cognitive effects in terms of neuroprotection, reducing neuroinflammation, neurooxidation, all of that. I think it's a really beneficial mushroom and I can see why it is the national treasure of Malaysia. And I'm really glad someone like Dr. Tan Chan Seng, or not someone like Dr. Chan Seng Seng, him specifically was able to figure out how to cultivate this mushroom and bring it to the masses. If it wasn't for us, we probably wouldn't even be making this podcast. We wouldn't have come out with this product. We needed to figure out the cultivation and that's also going to drive more research and hopefully we can do some research on this too and figure out maybe if there are some terpenoids in there or something similar. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's so much that still hasn't been discovered about functional mushrooms. Mm -hmm. And that's one of my favorite parts about it because the research is ongoing and there's something new to be discovered basically every single day. Yeah. Um, but with that in mind, I also think it's amazing to learn more through research practices about the mushrooms that have been used in traditional practices mm -hmm. for hundreds of years. And of course, um, we can we can kind of assume that if something's been in use for such a long time for specific purposes, that it's still going to have these beneficial effects. But now we have different tools and different methods and scientific instruments that can help us determine exactly why that's happening. And uh, we're really glad that we were able to get Jay, our lab director, on for a segment of the podcast to talk about the research that um, Omniant Labs is doing for lion's mane mushroom and all of the different steps that they go through to make sure that the mushroom supplements that Nootropics Depot sells are the real stuff, um, that they're going to be effective, and that we have a lot of different options to choose from. Absolutely. When it comes to the mushroom kingdom, as you can see, there's a lot of different varieties of lion's mane that we're currently growing. And we want to find the one that's going to be the best to use as a supplement and that's going to have those really beneficial effects because that's really what I'm after at the end of the day. I'm not a scientist, but I'm someone who takes supplements every single day. And I think mushroom supplements are really appealing and beneficial for a whole wide variety of people, not just nootropics geeks. Absolutely. And of course, I am a scientist and I am very interested in what it is doing and what it's doing on paper, but like you, for me, the real human experience is the most important. I want to be able to have these things interface with me and enhance my daily experience, enhance my cognitive function, enhance my general overall health. Tiger milk mushroom is definitely one of those things and I can feel it. The research is there. 
it's an interesting mushroom just from an intellectual perspective. The, the growing, the history behind it, the human use, the traditional use, where it's being found. It's, it's a really fabled mushroom and I think I like that uh, about it the most. There's, there's really a story to it. And I used to live in Malaysia, so for me this, this has some extra significance to it. Um, with that in mind, I think we should talk about some stacks too, because in yeah. Malaysia apparently they stack this with Tongadali. Tongadali is another Malaysian herb, uh, very popular over there and kind of native to that region of the world, similar with tiger milk mushroom, and they're oftentimes stacked together. I haven't really been able to figure out a good reason as to why they're being stacked together. That being said, there is a study looking at tiger milk mushroom and its effects on uh, physical performance, on exercise performance, and it seems to be positive. Tonga Dali obviously is positive there too, so I can imagine for kind of enhancing endurance and uh, a little bit in a similar vein to cordyceps mushroom, uh, potentially it would stack well with Tonga Dali. Maybe in the future we'll find that tiger milk is also enhancing testosterone levels or androgen or hormone levels a little bit. Who knows? The At this point there's nothing we can say about that. Yeah. Although the way that you describe um, the sensation of taking tiger milk and the fact that it makes you more assertive, more clear, um, perhaps more directive, that all reminds me a lot of some of the confidence boosting effects of Tonga Dali. Yeah, and so true. for that reason, I think they would be a really, really great pair. I think so too. The benefits would definitely build on each other and perhaps that's a good place to start mm -hmm. just talking about a confidence boosting stack. Yeah, so then I would definitely do tiger milk mushroom, tonga dali, and tribulus. Or if you want a little bit of a different flavor, and this might even be a little bit more interesting for the acute effects, tiger milk mushroom, tribulus, fenugreek, and cordyceps mushroom, the 10 to 1 specifically. That will, the cordyceps mushroom will enhance the energizing effects of the tribulus a little bit more, or you can say the tribulus is enhancing the energizing effects of the cordyceps a little bit more, and really giving a more stimulating mood boosting effect, together with like the focusing and somewhat energizing effects of tiger milk mushroom. Um, and then the fenugreek helps smooth out everything, but also adds an extra layer of confidence. I was reading um, on a thread recently, someone was saying when they combine tribulus and fenugreek, well actually they were saying when they take tribulus they have the best confidence ever but when they take tribulus and fenugreek together it was like hitting god mode. <laughs> so <laughs> awesome. I thought that was interesting and I think they will go well together for a confidence uh, stack especially because it seems to help verbal fluency a little bit so being able to have that confidence and verbal fluency those two are going to really play off of each other I think that's going to give a fantastic overall effects profile absolutely so to take um, a very different approach for a stack suggestion then I was thinking perhaps we can talk about a respiratory stack mm -hmm. um, because the tiger milk mushroom is certainly helping our respiratory function. Absolutely. I was thinking we could start with tiger milk and then add andrographis paniculata. Yep, that would be my recommendation too. For sure. And then we can also add in some glutathione because I think yep. in general glutathione is really essential for respiratory function. Yes. And I'm going to take just a moment to think about what might be a nice kind of cherry on top? Hmm. How about tart cherry? Hey, that would be great. So <laughs> whenever I think back to the first podcast that we recorded, um, we did talk a lot about respiratory function and we talked a lot about inflammation and tart cherry was our very first ever podcast for In Search yeah. of Insight. And we touched on that there. So for this respiration stack then, tiger milk, um, tart cherry, glutathione, and finally, andrographis, andrographis paniculata. <laughs> yes. And this one is going to be really good for just breathing deeper, um, keeping healthy lungs and supporting the fluids that we need in our lungs and blood flow to the lungs yeah. and just helping um, breathing overall. And then I think that's a perfect leeway into the cognition stack. Yes. And I think there we can play around quite a bit. So we're hitting NGF and NGF combined with BDNF, uh, I think is really interesting. And if we kind of go on that same effects profile where 
Tiger Milk is substituting basically for NGF uh, by acting directly on TRKA receptor, I think we can then look at 7,8-DHF to do a similar thing with the TRKB receptor, which is where B and EDF binds. So combining those two, you have NGF mimetic effects, you have BDNF mimetic effects. I think those are gonna go great together. Now, on top of that, what would we want to round out the cognitive effects with? I think maybe like a little bit more of that introspective feeling, a little bit more full rounded. I think cognance would be interesting there. Definitely. Hitting the 5-HD2A receptor with the NGF, with the BDNF, I think that will boost things up quite a bit. And then personally, I would maybe to, to get like a little bit more in that creative mindset, I would add in some saffron to get a little bit more serotonergic activity in there. I think that would round it out very nicely. You would also get some NMDA antagonism from the saffron and some sigma receptor agonism. And I think all of that together would make for a really fantastic cognitive stack. Definitely. Okay, now there's one more stack that I want to put together um, because I think the digestion benefits are really noticeable for me. I'm very curious to know if it is for anybody else out there. So, tiger milk, ginger extract, mm -hmm. apigenin. And maybe for the ginger extract, we could even swap it out. And you haven't tried this one yet. Ginger but, and ecmela. Uh, yeah, the mitodial. Yes, yes. Okay, so tiger milk, mitodol, yeah. um, apigenin, and hmm, there's definitely another element that I think we can consider for inflammation or oxidation purposes. Maybe C3G? C3G. Yeah, like we discussed earlier. Mm -hmm. So that would be a really well-rounded stack to kind of bring out some more of the gastrointestinal and digestion benefits of tiger milk mushroom. Agreed. That brings us to the end of the podcast for yeah. today. Um, it's been a deep dive. Absolutely. That was really fun. And I feel mm. like we were certainly um, supported in the depth of detail and just how fun it was to film this podcast by taking the double dose of um, the tiger milk mushroom. I thought you were going to say by Jay, which Jay, oh, yes, thank you. Of course. Thank you, you definitely Jay. increased the depth of knowledge. And, uh, yeah, absolutely. But tiger milk, you were a very good ally too. Yes, but Jay yes, definitely sure. helped kind of increase um, our depth of knowledge a little bit more on the analytical side. And like we talked about, you will get to hear Jay talk about um, more of the science, what's going on in the lab on his own video soon. Yes, I'm really excited to watch those because I learned so much from talking with him on the podcast and I'm sure all of you did as well. So we would love to know uh, what your questions are for Jay, what your questions are for us about tiger milk mushroom, about lion's mane, about the mushroom kingdom and the mushroom growth process, about um, everything that we're doing in the lab to research these mushrooms, because this is a really exciting development and a new project that we have going on. And the more feedback and questions we get, the better equipped we are to answer them and to create products that will basically deliver what you're looking for. Um, with that in mind, we love all the feedback that we've been getting from our first video podcast, and we're really glad to be able to film the podcast in this function, um, in this form. So you can watch the podcast on YouTube and also on Spotify. And for anyone who wants to revisit certain parts of the podcast, you can always check through the chapters that are available in the YouTube description and go back to a certain point to revisit, re-listen. And we ask that if you aren't currently subscribed to our Reddit, that you go check us out because there's conversations similar to this one being had basically 24 hours a day on our subreddit, and that's r slash Nootropics Depot. So go subscribe, give us a thumbs up on this YouTube video, share the In Search of Insight podcast with your friends, and let us know what you would like to see us talk about and feature on the podcast because we really appreciate all of your feedback. That brings us to the very, very end, and we're excited to see you next month with an exciting new topic, lots of research, new stack ideas, and more nootropic supplements to deep dive into. Absolutely. So with see that- See you next time. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.